Good morning, we're gonna go ahead and call the uh, regional transportation meeting for December 5th uh, to order. Can we begin with an, a roll call? Commissioner Lowe? Here. Commissioner Bertrand? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Alternate Lynn? Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Present. Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Friend? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Commissioner Alternate Johnson? Here. Commissioner Bator? Here. Commissioner Gonzalez? Here. Great, uh, we'll begin with uh, oral communications. This is a time when anyone from the public can address us on any item that is not on the agenda. Please come up, introduce yourself, thank you. to spend Measure D money on, uh, on items that are not in the expenditure plan for Measure D, yes. that there's a process for you to do that. Uh, and I didn't see in the staff report any indication that you were about to go through that process. So uh, just wanna recall that to your attention. You may wanna re-examine that. But I think the bigger picture is that uh, this next round of auxiliary lanes, which was being proposed for uh, expenditure in, in your last meeting is uh, beyond the mandate of, of, of the voters of Measure D. And the way I understand the decision that you had to make when you put Measure D together was that you thought you needed to put something in uh, on the highway to give people who are stuck on the highway something that they could look forward to in order for them to vote for, for Measure D. Now, at the time, we were arguing that it doesn't make sense to offer people something that doesn't work. And the EIR on the highway projects have shown that the auxiliary lanes are not gonna work to reduce congestion. This next auxiliary lane, which is from SoCal to 41st, actually worsens congestion in the afternoon commute if you look at the EIR. So this next round of uh, uh, auxiliary lanes from State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard, it's not understandable to me why you would want to spend money on that. I understand why you did it, Measure D, because you wanted to show people something to, that they were, you know, but even though it wasn't accurate to say it would reduce the GS, you just, it was for show. But why continue the charade in this next round? Thank you. Anyone else like to address the commission? Just, just for advice, the I believe the yellow light is just a warning that they, that you have. Is it a one minute to go? Another minute. I don't want to cut you off, Rick. If you, uh, it's a, you, you weren't. You got the point. I definitely got the point. I just want you to feel like you were cheated out of time. So the red light means you're done. Yellow light is your warning to, to, to pretty much wrap up. So, so I can have his minute? You can't do that, but, <laughs> but uh, I'd love to hear your three minutes. So go ahead. Good try. Okay. Good try. Um, again, happy holidays. Michael Saint, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, let's talk about executive order uh, in 1919 from Governor Newsom. I'm pretty sure all of you have heard about that. I think the governor is trying to do his best to try and steer us in the right direction and help us all fight the effects of climate change. Um, even Caltrans has taken notice on this, mainly because the orders from the governor made a pretty significant change with its ITIP draft for 2020. It removed three highway widening projects in the Central Valley and along San Luis Obispo saving nearly $33 million in highway widening funds uh, to align itself with Governor Newsom's executive order. This all sounds so fantastic, it's kind of unbelievable. Uh, but hold on, it is unbelievable. Um, they got the news, people got the news, and a lot of bad press came out, and these advances towards a better use of state funds have been put back into these projects. Um, basically, the same old battle continues in our democracy, big business, special interests, and groups raised a stink, and now things are going back to the old school. The fossil fuel interests, auto industry, big banks do not want government uh, meddling in what to do or bothering their bottom line, and that's kind of the whole problem in our society. The point is, is how ironic that they feel this way. They, at one point, they do want government, the next time they do not want government. Government's okay when we need a bailout, subsidies to keep 
our profit margins up during a recession. Examples of this, bailout of the auto industry from 2009 or 2008 to 2014. $81 billion, bank bailouts during the last recession, $700 billion. Fossil fuel subsidies, and if you didn't know this, uh, those exceed the spending that the Pentagon has for its budget every year, $649 billion. And of course, 87% of Trump tax cuts going to big business and the wealthy. These are all atrocious. But I think even by w worse by far is when these same entities try and put a stop to our progress towards combating climate change by focusing on their bottom line or using any excuse to continue business as usual. It is again a battle between the corporate machine and misdirected government and environmentalists once again. And I hope all 12 of you, all of us, had better be praying that the environmentalist, environmentalists win this one, our civilization Civilization depends on that victory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this the consent agenda? No, this is a, a open comment, oral communications. Um, I guess Speaking. I'll have, uh, this is Kerry Pico. I live in Aptos. And even none of this is exactly on the consent agenda, although it's, it's all related. I strongly suggest that the RTC get an oversight, a citizens oversight committee for many of the things that I will be later on um, talking about regarding fiscal management, uh, project oversight, uh, contract enforcement. I won't be talking about contract enforcement, but um, I'm just really, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I got into this not because I was pro-train or anti-train or anything like that. It's about fiscal responsibility and accountability, and I haven't seen that, um, which is why I'm here. And I do want to say one last thing. I don't like coming down here. This is like the last thing I want to do with my time, and um, I don't think you guys want to hear me talk either. So um, really, let, let's talk about uh, accountability for what the RTC is doing spending money wisely and not throwing away. There are many things that I will talk about that I just see doing it again or throwing money down the tubes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to the commission during uh, uh, oral communications? Dr. Bertrand, you had a comment? Yeah, I was wondering if staff could respond to that because I believe we have a citizens oversight committee for the... <laughs> Luis, go ahead and uh, expand uh, yes, on that. Yes, uh, I mean, the commission does have uh, uh, three, um, well, actually four uh, standing committees. One, that's the uh, uh, Budget Administration Personnel Advisory Committee, that's just as commissioners of, of the RTC that do you know, review a variety of things that come to the commission, particularly budget-related and expense-related items. You also have a measure decisions advisory committee that is correct it has been established to make sure that uh, any expenditures that come out of measure d funds are in accordance with the with the measure and they do provide their you know annual uh, report uh, that that is as public and it's on the RTC website. Uh, the commission also has a bus and pedestrian advisory committee, which is made up of, of uh, citizens as well as uh, representation from uh, organizations that the RTC uh, works with, uh, and also the elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee that also includes citizens and organizations that the RTC uh, works with. Uh, you also do have the interagency interagency technical advisory committee that. Uh, has representation from all, all of the uh, local jurisdictions from your public works and plan departments as well as, uh, as uh, UCSC and Santa Cruz Metro and others. So you do have a variety of committees, but naturally if the RTC field sees that there's a need for uh, additional committees, you are free to establish committees as you see fit. And, and there is a uh, citizens oversight committee associated with Measure D. How often do they meet? Um, I believe it's four times a year. Well, the, the measure does not establish uh, uh, any frequency. It says that they shall meet, I think, at least twice a year, is I believe what the measure says. But I think, they, I think they met three times in the past year. Okay, great. Commissioner Schiffman. I have a question um, also for Luis, but finding the word. Is there anything in Measure D that prevents the uh, commission from moving forward with their zero year? 
We do not believe so. We believe it's included in the expenditure plan. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move away from oral communications. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the consent agenda? Yes? Who has those? Yes, there are several oh, um, handouts and replacement pages that are um, hand in front of you and posted on the website as well available to the public. So there's a replacement page for item five, a replacement page for item 13, a handout for item 18, a replacement, uh, two replacement pages for item 22, a replacement page for item 24, and a handout for item 25. And that's all available for the public? Okay, great. All right, uh, Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Yes, I, I have a few questions on item 10 at, um, at some given time. Okay, I'm gonna get to the consent agenda. I have a couple things to clean up before I get there. Is it about the consent agenda or? or okay, go ahead, Director. Commissioner, you wanna wait? I'm gonna wait, okay. Uh, I'm gonna bring to the consent agenda, and before I open that up, uh, I'm gonna get a comment from uh, Commissioner Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just need to recuse myself on two items on the consent agenda, item seven and 12, which deal with the rail line. I have a primary, my primary residence is within 500 feet of the rail line, so I have a conflict for uh, rail-related items. Okay, is there any uh, commissioners that would like to pull anything from the consent agenda? <laughs> Any uh, anyone from the <coughs> excuse me anyone from the public have a comment on anything on the consent agenda? Mr. Pico, come on up. Uh, Kerry Pico, Aptos, uh, consent agenda item seven: engineering services for bridge repairs and rail corridor. Uh, these repairs. Um, my first suggestion is repairs should be uh, um, evaluated for potential use as rail traffic alone, rail with trail combined use, or trail alone. And the reason is with the La Selva trestle that they've rebuilt, there's no possibility for pedestrian use on there. I believe that was a total, uh, not total, but a, but a, a really loss of opportunity to add, opportun uh, to add the trail uh, adjustment. Secondly, uh, regarding this, I'm not complaining about the money because this is about a study, but it's many of the repairs should have been done already. They've spent 5.6 to 5.9 million, depending on the accounting, uh, on bridge repairs from Pajaro up through Hidden Beach. I personally saw the crew working in Hidden Beach. And for me to hear that it has to be redone is pretty upsetting. And this is why I talk about the Citizens Oversight Committee. If the RTC cannot manage a project and get it done properly and making us come back and do it again, this is my understanding that it wasn't done properly the first time, why should we trust the RTC to do it again? Second issue is uh, consent for the railroad, item 12, consent for the railroad crossing agreement. Um, it states that there's no fiscal impact on on the RTC, which I agree, but there's a huge fiscal impact on the county. Uh, it says, they kind of put in around, they're asking for $400,000, but we all know that it's a $3.2 million project. Approximately 1.5 million of that is related to railroad uh, accommodation costs, including uh, contamination, uh, dealing with a railroad in the middle of an intersection, kind of thing like that. And so, I urge the commission to object to this project and actually put some uh, sanity back into the public spending, but I will need to say, I wrote this up before I understood that it's part of the Aptos Village project, but I do want uh, the commission to understand that uh, the presence of the rail is causing a huge increase on county spending, and that's really where I'm coming back to fiscal uh, accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Sally Arnold, board chair, Friends of the Rail and Trail. And um, not surprisingly, we have a different perspective on these bridge repairs. We're really pleased to see that um, the, there's a review and design process beginning. Um, we really appreciate staff who've been working to make it happen. And um, yeah, you know, repairing infrastructure is expensive. I think that the question is, uh, do we want to use this infrastructure? And we do. And we, it's important for us to have more ways to move people around the county. And getting those bridges repaired is one of the things that will help make that happen. And therefore, it's a worthwhile expenditure. And we appreciate that you're considering it today and we urge you to vote yes. Thank you. 
Good morning. Good morning, uh, I'm Barry Scott, I live in Aptos, and uh, I'm here today just to thank you all. I see all of these fabulous investments across all of our different modes of transportation, and with uh, measure six, uh, uh, the 2016 measure having passed and money rolling in, I'm seeing resurfacing of streets, I'm seeing improvements on the highway, I'm seeing maintenance on the rail line, I see uh, segments of the trail about to begin, and um, I'm, I'm just really, really proud of where this county is and where this body is, and I wanna thank all of you because I know it's a lot of hard work and the RTC staff, uh, it's great to see projects happening, so good job, thanks. Thank you. We actually got a compliment. I, I think good. we've had a couple compliments, so it's not I the know. first, but we appreciate them, so thank you for that comment, Commissioner. Good. good morning. Good morning. Uh, Keith Otto on item 12. Uh, quick question, so if that goes forward, right, is there work that's gonna take place that's going to have to be redone as a result of whatever comes back from the um, high capacity public transit study. In other words, are we gonna do something there for that intersection and then have to redo it depending upon what comes back from the study? And if so, then maybe the order there should be reversed, get the results of that, figure out what needs to be done on that intersection and then go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Commissioners, my name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer with more than three decades of experience in designing public works infrastructure in the county of Santa Cruz and beyond. I uh, want to echo Mr. Scott's comments earlier. I commend the commission and the commission staff for an outstanding job of investing the taxpayers' money using Measure D money to upgrade the infrastructure across the county and particularly the rail line, which uh, needs some infrastructure. This is a good investment. This is smart use of taxpayer money. So I also want to add a compliment to all of you and the great job the staff is doing. Thank you. Thank you. See, Greg, that's two compliments. Okay, so. It was really three, yeah. I okay. think. <laughs> Ms. Arnold. Was Thank you for the accounting. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, anybody else like to uh, address the commission with anything, comments on the consent agenda? Okay, we'll bring it back. Are there any comments on the consent agenda? Sure, go ahead. Um, it's a question on item number 12. Is it, is it on now? At all. Andy. Uh, sorry. You can tell I'm not here often. Um, the, uh, the, this is the railroad uh, crossing agreement with Aptos Creek. Uh, my concern is that the county, uh, the commission had a, a previous agreement with the county for a crossing of the rail line. And while it was initially presented to the commission as having no cost impact uh, on the commission, the commission ended up having to pay a good deal of money, um, I think, for hazardous material cleanup. I just want to make sure this is not a project that the commission is initiating. It's not a project that the commission uh, has any uh, need to have happen. This is a county-generated project. I just want to be clear that this agreement, I read it over, it wasn't really clear to me. Uh, I don't know whether there should be another provision in there that no costs of this project should be imposed on the county, uh, on the commission, because I think that was an unfortunate oversight with the last agreement, and uh, we don't, we never know how, how these things are gonna work out, but I don't think it's uh, proper for the commission to be paying for, uh, even part, for a project that the, uh, is assisting a developer and the county in carrying out one of their projects. Would you guys like to elaborate on it, one of you two? Like to uh, I, it is kind of a question. It, it, to make it sure that it's, this agreement is different from the last agreement, then there will be no cost impact on well, the county. Well, I think we, we can work with- On the, the commission. Yeah, we can work with the county to um, um, you know, have that condition as part of your consent, if, uh, if you would like. Um, and, um, and and make sure that that. Well, I think based on our previous experience, it would be a, a wise move to make that. Okay. Just be clear that since this is not a commission-initiated project, it doesn't benefit the commission. There should be no cost to the commission as a result, irrespective of what needs to be done to make the project happen. 
Okay. Well, so you, you can add that condition to the. I would, uh, when the when a motion is made. I'm going to clarify that because if this becomes more involved, we may end up pulling this. So, is there conditions in here right now that have the RTC? Is he, are you trying to change some of the conditions that are in the agreement that's uh, that's been before us today? I'm try I think I'm trying to add a, a clarification. It's just from reading over the agreement, it's unclear that there won't be, that there's, it, it appears that there, that the county's gonna cover all the costs, but that's how it appeared last time. And somehow the, county, the commission ended up having to spend uh, a significant amount of money. So. I'm gonna let the ED address this and see if it adds clarification. If not, I'll ask more questions. So I would have to specifically review the agreement with respect to hazardous materials because I think that's what the main concern is here. Often um, hazardous materials are considered the responsibility of the underlying property owner and we will ensure that in this particular case uh, if, if the commission so desires that um, that responsibility be um, uh, that of the developer, and that can be conditioned into um, whatever approvals um, you so choose to make. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna pull this item and put it at the agenda. We're gonna have some conversation on this. I, I, it's inappropriate to do it now, and I think there's enough, I see enough like inquiry that at least we should open this up a little bit more. So we're gonna take, uh, that is, 12, we're talking about 12, and we're gonna move it down to, let's pick a good number, it's gonna be uh, 25A. All right, we're gonna do that, and we'll, uh, we'll figure it out at that point. Any other, uh, Commissioner Kaufman Gomez, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, for for item 10, um, I would like to see if we can possibly get um, the community bridges to talk to us in terms of the small presentation at some point. Um, I know that they also have an EV vehicle, so I, as the commission and with what we're investing with them, um, it would be helpful for us to know a little bit about that. And um, a quarterly cost of the ridership, um, Part of it too is I, I, I'd like to see about a compare and contrast between Paracruise and Liftline. I, and I know that that's not really transportation, you know, project kind of thing, but we are funding both of them. And I just wanted to have a better understanding of the differences. And um, also, since they do have an EV vehicle that uh, there is public transit, I think that's our first that we've got here. And it would be helpful for us to have a little bit of an insight of how that's working out. Are you asking for that? to come later, you're, you're, do you have any right. problems with this current uh, um, item? That I don't have issues with this, but because I have questions about this and I think that we can probably, they're not here to probably specifically ask, it may be as a request to have them come back so that we can actually have a presentation. Okay, yeah. but we can move forward with this yes. item. I think that's a great idea. You got that, thank you. Hello. My, mine <laughs> is loosely connected to this, but uh, more connected to the comments uh, that were made with the freeway. Uh, Is your mic on, Greg? Yeah, I, I believe, yes it is. Okay, there you go. Okay, All I gotta right. speak Thank you. into it. Uh, if, we, if we have the auxiliary lanes and we also have metering lights on uh, Highway 1, uh, a lot of people think we're trying to get the freeway and the traffic to move at 50 or 60 miles an hour, but we don't have to do that. If the, if the auxiliary lanes can even get the traffic to move smoothly at 30 miles an hour, it'll cut the commute traffic down between Larkin Valley and uh, Park Avenue by about 20 minutes or a half an hour. So uh, I think the auxiliary lanes with metering lights will be able to do that. It'll be able to get people to actually keep moving rather than stop, go. That accordion effect causes big backups and uh, where you're actually not moving at all. So that's all I wanted to mention. I Any move other? the consent agenda as amended. I'll second. Uh, can, uh, before we do that, can I just ver modify that a little bit? Can we just um, um, approve it excluding item seven and 12? I've got recusal, so I'd like to vote on every item except for seven and 12. Well, 12 has been pulled. Okay, 12, okay, so um, that'd be just item seven. Are you pulling seven? Sh well, but then it, I think just uh, Commissioner Frank can just abstain on number seven. Is abstaining is, is adequate? 
Okay. Correct. All right. Then we'll, on we'll do a that. Consent, okay. On a consent so item, he can. He can just note the abstention for the record on a consent item. Okay, great. All right. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Appreciate then I've got a uh, motion and a second was by? No, this is Kaufman. Kaufman. Kaufman Gomez. Okay, great. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. And abstention on seven, please. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so that'll take us to the regular agenda. We have uh, commissioner reports. Any commissioner have anything they'd like to present? I just have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is there a way for me to get the emails ahead of time? Is there some sort of website option? Because I'm going to suggest maybe a Dropbox, because I come in early to read the emails from people that want to comment, and I don't have enough time. And so if these are available like before the meeting, I'd love to know. Commissioner Bertrand, the cutoff um, time for comments from the public is Wednesday at noon, so that would have been yesterday. So we can certainly send those to you as soon as we receive them, but it would be after Wednesday at noon. I did send out an email earlier um, on Tuesday with all of the additional handouts and the replacement pages, which we will continue to do, uh, but the comments from the public will come a little bit later. Can we like just do a Dropbox and then I could just log into it? You don't have to send, that'd be for everyone. We post them on our RTC website. Okay. So we uh, will send you an email alerting you that those have been posted. Thank you. Any other commissioner reports or comments? Okay, we'll move on to uh, item 18, the director's report. Thank you, Chair Botto and commissioners. The Self-Help Counties Coalition held its annual conference called Focus on the Future on November 18th and 19th in San Diego. Senior transportation engineer Sarah Christensen and I attended this year. There are now 24 local county transportation agencies in California that are considered self-help counties, including Santa Cruz, delivering supermajority voter-approved transportation sales tax measures. These measures combined are expected ge to generate $194 billion for essential transportation programs and projects. These counties represent 88% of California's total population. The theme of the 2019 conference was building on the promise. The conference was extremely helpful in networking with agencies on how best to deliver the improvements identified in RTC's Measure D expenditure plan. In addition to meeting with other self-help counties, I had the opportunity to meet with the California Transportation Commission staff to discuss RTC's proposed projects for upcoming SB1 grant programs, including the Active Transportation Program, the Solutions to Congested Corridors Program, and the local partnership program. Caltrans' new director, Tokes Omishakin, addressed both the board's self-help county directors and the full conference as a keynote speaker. Tokes comes to California from the Tennessee Department of Transportation, where he served as Deputy Commissioner for Environmental and Planning. During his career, Omishakin strongly supported efforts to develop more and safer biking, walking, and non-motorized mobility options. Omishakin is expected to be an advocate for many of the values instilled within Santa Cruz County, especially with respect to implementing complete streets projects on the state highway system, including those on Highway 1, 9, 129, and 152. I highlighted the Measure D expenditure plan, including RTC's active transportation program, as well as the Highway 1 Bus on Shoulders Auxiliary Lane program as an innovative way to provide um, congestion release and increased safety without increasing the overall highway capacity. Last month, I announced that staff has been working on development of the inaugural Measure D strategic implementation plan. The focus of the plan will be on maximizing the delivery of all regional projects and programs identified in the expenditure plan with an emphasis on how best to leverage Measure D funds to secure grants in order to fully fund and deliver the plan. The draft plan is expected by the end of this month with a public hearing expected for the January RTC meeting. RTC interviewed eight applicants to create a list of qualified candidates and fill RTC's two vacant transportation planning positions. The RTC interview committee ranked eight applicants and created a list of qualified candidates for future employment as a transportation planner. I am pleased to announce that RTC has promoted Tommy Travers one of the two vacant planner positions. 
Tommy started at RTC as a planning tech te technician in December 2017 and has been serving as a transportation planner on a provisional appointment since April 2019. Tommy has a bachelor's degree in urban studies with a focus on planning from San Francisco State University and a GIS analyst certificate. Tommy has been the staff person to RTC's bicycle advisory committee since May of, of this year. He has also been working with contractors, other RTC staff, local jurisdictions, local law enforcement, and members of the community to coordinate rail and trail corridor maintenance activities. Working with the RTC's senior engineer, Tommy has been implementing the countywide bike signage project, which is nearly completed. Tommy has also participated with a variety of other projects, including the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Complete Streets Plan, production of GIS maps, and public outreach events and activities. Congratulations to Tommy. We are in the final steps of hiring a second candidate for RTC's other transportation planner vacancies and should have an announcement by the January RTC meeting. RTC is also in the process of interviewing candidates to create a similar list of qualified candidates for transportation planning technician positions for which RTC now has two vacancies because Tommy was promoted. I expect to have announcements on appointments to RTC's vacant planning technicians also at the January RTC meeting. RTC staff participated in the 20th annual San Lorenzo Valley Environmental Town Hall event on November 23rd. The event featured guest speaker, State Assembly Member Mark Stone, and highlighted over 25 agencies dedicated to the betterment of our county's environment. At the RTC booth, there was a lot of positive interest in the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Complete Streets Corridor Plan. People were excited about the improvements laid out in the plan and were eager to get moving on getting the projects delivered. Earlier this year, RTC was awarded a $250,000 Highway Safety Improvement Program, or HSIP, grant to deliver crosswalk safety improvements in the San Lorenzo Valley. I am pleased to announce that Caltrans has agreed to add crosswalk enhancements at at least one location in Felton on Highway 9 near the Wild Roots Market to an existing Caltrans project. With Chair Bothauer's approval, I have executed a cooperative agreement with Caltrans for $50,000 of the HSIP grant funds to have Caltrans construct the planned improvements at that location. Construction is expected in the spring of 2020. Staff is conti continuing to negotiate with Caltrans on implementing improvements at the other locations. RTC also continues to work with Caltrans on a proposed funding agreement for a Caltrans project initiation document for other components of the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Complete Streets Plan. I expect to bring future cooperative funding agreements to the Commission for consideration after negotiation on the terms of the funding agreement are complete with Caltrans. Segment 7, Phase 1 of the Coastal Rail Trail will be, be breaking ground soon. To celebrate this milestone, Ecology Action and Friends of the Rail Trail will be hosting a groundbreaking celebration on January 25th from 1 to 3 at the Santa Cruz Mountain Brewing Company. All members of the community are invited. The City of Watsonville has advertised a portion of Segment 18 between Olani Parkway and the Watson View, Watsonville Slough Trailhead for construction bids. Bids are expected to be open on December 17th with construction starting in 2020. RTC staff is currently working on the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan. As part of this, we are seeking public input to help guide the goals, targets, and policies for the plan. Members of the public can provide input to help inform the plan by taking a short survey. Answer from the survey will help us update the goals, targets, and policies and define priority projects. A link to the survey can be found on the homepage of the RTC website. The RTC office will be closed for the holidays on December 24th, a half day, December 25th, and January 1st. These holidays fall midweek this season. A significant number of RTC staff, including front office staff, has requested vacation for a good portion of the week from December 23rd through January 2nd. Although some staff is expected to be present in the office during this period, I have safety and security concerns about having the office open to foot traffic if the front office is not fully staffed. Past experience has shown that there is not a lot of foot traffic during this period. 
in order not to have to reject vacation requests, and in the best interest of staff safety and security, I've decided to close the office to foot traffic during this period. Staff will be reachable by electronic means, including phone and email as usual. RTC staff wishes you, your family and friends, a safe, help, healthy, and happy holiday season. That concludes my report. Any questions of the director? Seeing none, any comments from the public on the uh, director's report? Yes, Brian Peoples, executive um, director of Trail Now. I wanna make a correction. The organization is Friends of Rails and Trails. It's not Friends of Rail Trail. They're specifically for the train. So we wanna really, if you can make a correction on that, it's really important, thank you. Thank you, any other comments? Okay, bring it back. No other comments on that. Move on to uh, item 19, Caltrans report, Ms. Lowe. Good morning, commissioners, and happy holidays to everyone from District 5. I would like to mention that uh, this week at the California Transportation Commission, Caltrans unveiled the draft California Freight Mobility Plan. Uh, this plan is to, to um, support the needs that we have to move freight efficiently effectively um, use sustainable and innovative techniques to support California's economy through the continuous and um, increasing demand for freight uh, around the state. Uh, I will mention that uh, uh, as was um, brought up earlier in regard to the Interregional Transportation Improvement Program, the ITIP, um, a project that, uh, that does feature prominently both in the, freight, in the state's freight plan and the interregional mobility plan is the Highway 46 corridor. And you may be familiar with that as about a 60 mile corridor between US 101 on the Central Coast and Interstate 5 in Kern County. There's been a, a tremendous investment of funds there to, to uh, have that corridor um, go through its metamorphosis from a two lane conventional highway with uh, high speed traffic um, passing each other Posing, um, at, you know, within feet of each other in large trucks, to a four-lane divided <coughs> expressway, and it does, in some manners, ev uh, evoke uh, images of old-school uh, <coughs> expansion. But I do want to say that some of the um, system completion uh, that we're still committed to is very essential to um, traveler safety, uh, goods movement, freight mobility, uh, and the environment. And we are excited to to see this through the, in District 5. There, um, there are three segments yet to be constructed. One is, um, uh, it's just east of the rest area for those of you who travel in that direction uh, from the uh, rest area in Shalam, uh, east going to what's referred to as the Y, which is the split at 4146. And then, that, and then that portion of 46 that goes up to the Kern County line is referred to as Antelope Grade. Um, the department's working um, diligently to see that project through. The antelope grade portion is referred to as the golden spike. Uh, there's another segment in Kern County that um, is held up more from a standpoint of utilities and uh, they have a, a large oil field that they're navigating at, at that end. But that is, um, that is an important asset to the state of California. Uh, and I think as we go forward with the direction that, that the governor has set forward at the N-1919, uh, and the new director, there's more that we're doing to also bring forward the importance of bicycling, um, pedestrian safety, uh, and, and really investing in that infrastructure as well. So I, I'm confident that the department can do both. We can um, chew gum, um, walk and chew gum at the same time, <laughs> even if I can't speak appropriately. Um, um, and uh, there's, there's plenty of work to do, um, uh, especially in the area of greenhouse gas emission reduction and uh, climate resiliency, and we are up for the task. Um, it's an exciting time. And you do have your uh, project update uh, report here, and I will note that the um, project that uh, your executive director mentioned uh, for the pedestrian accessibility, we are evaluating that to include um, additional locations. I just wanted to point out that it is, um, that project includes locations um, both in Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. It's, um, it has a, a lot of locations. It's an under, it's a very small dollar, total dollar job, but it, uh, sometimes we can have a lot of impact with our small, small jobs, and that's what we're hoping to do with that project. Any questions? 
Any questions for Ms. Lowe? Commissioner Caput. Sure. Uh, Riverside Drive, I call it Riverside Drive. say is a really good job they did uh, uh, getting that fixed up and they did it uh, quite uh, quickly uh, and so I want to thank you for that it's a big project uh, a lot of people use that especially to go to 101 to come up uh, either south or north on 101 uh, the other is uh, the Marchant Street and each be East Beach is still on schedule still on track uh, that would probably come under the Item six, uh, pedestrian si signal upgrades. Uh, uh, yes, um, Commissioner Caput, that's uh, listed as uh, project 19 on page four. Uh, yeah, there, um, yeah. That's the, the current schedule um, as. That's that uh, pedestrian cross. Yes, yes. There are some considerations um, um, adding, adding more locations and I'm not sure if that will impact the um, construction schedule at this time. It, 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 it scheduled, but it's, I don't see it actually specified in the, uh, you know, in the projects, uh, but it would probably come under safe routes to schools. It's right by Watsonville High School. Yes, um, yes, project number 19 is scheduled to go to construction um, this winter, uh, and depending on the outcome of, sure. of uh, these additional locations, whether, whether there's an adjustment to that, we'll keep you posted. You bet. And then uh, on Highway f 152, item 18, <coughs> uh, that's scheduled for 2022. 50% uh, of the money is uh, ready to go. But if we got the money earlier, if uh, maybe the federal highway uh, uh, funds opened up rather than, you know, right now they're shut down. But if the money was uh, received earlier for that, would uh, we be able to start construction be before 2022? Uh, Commissioner Caput, I believe um, you may be referencing the st um, the status of the completion of the PNED phase. Yeah, that is that's a, the we've one uh, on yes. high, um, right. We have achieved um, Road, uh, College Road, and uh, east of Beverly. Yes, that's Project 18, also on page four of the report. We're halfway through the the PNED phase, which is where we do the environmental review. The money is secured for the project. It's funded uh, through the SHOP program, and it would be on schedule for construction in spring of 2022. So there isn't a, there's, there's no funding gap that influences the schedule. It's the, it's the time frame to deliver that project. Right. And at this point, the, um, the project is now uh, a bridge widening project rather than a separate standalone. Oh, really? Yes. That, that'll add cost to the project though too, right? I, uh, I, uh, I believe the, um, it's still within the programmed amount. Okay. And we did get some more money for that, uh, uh, Mr. Preston. Uh, we got, you know, you know where I'm talking about Houlihan College Road and Highway 152. Uh, Commissioner Capit, uh, to you redo may all the signal lights. Yeah, you may be referring to the county's project. Okay. And uh, I believe that's going to be on your agenda later today for the RTIP. Okay, that's all right. Okay. Rachel can comment that on that more and during that item if you needed. Know. Okay, thank you very much. Any other uh, comments from commissioners? Anyone from the public have a question on the Caltrans report? Uh, Michael Saint, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Just a quick question for uh, Eileen on any update on those uh, handicapped vans, community bridges up to UCSC. I believe there were six of them, whether they're going to be electric, diesel, whatever. Uh, thank you through the chair. Thank you for bringing that up. I don't have an answer for you yet. I am pursuing that. And um, just as recollection, it was the 5310 program where EV purchases were not allowed. And the question last month was, can other funding be brought to bear so that EVs could still be purchased, so if I recall, because the 5310 program is a federal program and uh, EV was not allowed. And it had to do with um, uh, the expense of the EV and the ability to serve um, a larger, um, a larger um, population. So I'm still looking into that. When do you expect we might hear something back about Ho that? Um, hopefully at your January meeting. That would be great. 
Okay, okay. just one more helpful <laughs> suggestion. I was at a uh, electric vehicle ribbon cutting a couple days ago, Sea Cliff, and, and uh, Alan Romero of Monterey Bay Air Resource Board, the gentleman that does their funding uh, outlay, he said they're going to start a program, developing a program in January of 2020 to do just that, just fund handicapped vans in the Tri-County area. So you, as that, I don't know how long it's gonna take you, but maybe look into that in January or, or call Alan and see, because he said it's gonna be based on what you're gonna do with these vans, but it's specifically for the handicapped type, type community bridge plan. Yeah, thank so, you for that. Yeah, the Monterey yeah. Bay Air District has been a great partner. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'll make one more plug in that. Yeah, so there will be grant money for that. Yeah, in that regard, for folks that do travel south on the 101 corridor, if I didn't mention it before, the first ever high-powered fast chargers are now available at the Camp Roberts. There's one in each direction. There are four overhead solar panels that are necessary to, to power one fast charger and it is the first of its kind of solar charger, and that was um, a partnership between Caltrans and the Air District. The Air District uh, purchased those, and uh, the vendor placed it under permit. So if you have an EV, check it out. Great, good news. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna move on to, uh, let's see, item 20. I think we can do this. Uh, Corey Coletti, come on up. This is a, a resolution for appreciation for, this is a, a, a happy and sad moment for us because I'm happy for your future but sad for your loss, but uh, we'll get through this, okay? This is a resolution for Corey. And before I allow you to speak, which I know you're great at, <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna read some information here that we've uh, collected. So bear with me. Uh, I'm gonna read this all because Corey's been here for 22 years and it's worth it, okay? Thank so, you. Uh, <laughs> Um, whereas, Ms. Coletti will retire on December 30th after more than 22 years of extraordinary service, extraordinary service to the Santa Cruz County community as a Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission employee. employee. Whereas Corey Coletti, senior transportation planner, began her career in the, with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission on November 28th, 1995 as a student worker, took a 21-month hiatus being beginning on June 25, 1997, to secure her master's degree in planning and serve as a transportation planner at the Association of Monterey Barrier Governments and returned to the RTC as a transportation planner on April 5, 1999. Whereas during her tenure, Ms. Coletti has earned the respect and admiration of commissioners, management, coworkers, colleagues, and community members <laughs> it happens to me also, okay? So I don't want you to feel singled out. <laughs> Members, for her demonstrated professionalism, dedication, understanding, tenacity, cooperation, work ethic, caring, and enthusiasm to improve transportation in Santa Cruz County. Whereas during her tenure at the RTC, Mrs. Coletti has managed and played an essential role in the advancing of many projects and programs, including development and implementation of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, Network Plan, the North Coast Rail Trail Environmental Review, Measure D Development and Implementation, serving as the RTC's Bicycle Coordinator, Bicycle Committee Staffing and Reorganization, Bike Secure, Committee Solutions Rideshare Program, Don't Drive One in Five, True Cost of Driving Brochures, Clean Air Vehicle Fares, Neighbors Helping Neighbors, Van Pool Incentive Program, mm -hmm. RTC award programs and RTC annual reports, and many more not mentioned here. <laughs> Whereas, as a coworker, Mrs. Coletti has been a well-respected well -respected and respectful team member, team leader, and mentor, displaying great cooperation, coordination, compassion, encouragement, enthusiasm, generosity, teamwork, and a tenacious work ethic. Whereas Mrs. Coletti has served the people of Santa Cruz County with the highest level of loyalty, integrity, respect, professionalism, and dedication, and she will be missed by all. Therefore, it is resolved by the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission that we, the members of the Regional Transportation Commission Board, do hereby commend Corey Coletti for her more than 22 years of dedicated and exceptional service to the community of Santa Cruz County with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission 
we further extend our sincerest and most grateful appreciation and best wishes for many years of great health, happiness, and immense prosperity in her well-earned retirement. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm like really choked up. Um, but I do want to say a few, a few words. Um, this recognition means a lot to me. I, I thank you, commissioners. I thank you, staff, uh, for the acknowledgement. I'm really honored to have worked in the service of the important work that you do here. Transportation and mobility choices impact the quality of our daily lives and the climate crisis that we're facing. Um, your leadership is really critical in making positive strides. I've had the pleasure of working directly with some of you, and I've been really appreciative and impressed by your leadership, by your commitment to our community and our planet, and to a healthy public and democratic process. I've also appreciated your defense of staff and our professional integrity and expertise when we've come under fire personally. I'm lucky to have worked at my dream job and also to leave here today feeling satisfied in the knowledge that I made a substantial contribution. I've been in this field close to 30 years with 22 of those being here in the service of the RTC. I brought my passion for bicycling and on the road knowledge gained via the thousand of miles I ride each year all over the county to my bicycle planning, committee staffing, and rail trail project implementation. To have my passion for cycling and my commitment to an equitable and sustainable world be congruent is something I never took for granted. It was a gift. While you have an immensely talented staff, I need to thank a few standouts. Luis Mendez and former Executive Director John George Dondero for entrusting me with a high-profile, career-defining rail trail project and for their empowering leadership styles. Also to my RTC coworkers and partner agency colleagues who have become like family, your work ethic, your integrity, your thoughtful communication, your commitment to excellence, and your kindness, even under pressure, inspired me every day to bring my best self forward. I will really miss working with you, and I know the projects I had the pleasure to lead are in excellent hands. Finally, a huge thank you to John Coletti, <laughs> my partner in life, in play, in politics. John stood st steadfast by me during my decades of singular focus on the work we do here, even when the cost to him was personal. He also helped me realize that I have many other dreams and that a good book is made great by the progression of the next chapter. I find that now is a great time to begin that next chapter. So thank you very much for the privilege to serve. Excuse me, commissioners, just a quick reminder, it is a resolution, so you need a motion, a second, and a vote. I get to take a picture with you. This Yay. is my favorite picture, okay? So we had a motion by uh, Commissioner Leopold and a second by Kaufman Gomez. With that, <laughs> I'm sorry, we're going to correct. Okay, so a motion by Leopold and a second by Schifrin. With that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. Passes unanimously. Okay, we got one more quick order of business here before we get to our public hearing. I think we can do this pretty quick. Uh, this is a uh, election of the 2020 RTC chair and vice chair oral report. This will be quick. Um, I just want to thank uh, the co my fellow commissioners and the public and the staff, especially the staff, because 
you can't do this job up here without the staff making you look good, and they, they do that all the time. I, I really appreciate the presentations they made through the whole year. I think we all remember that we probably started January, there was more turbulence than not, and uh, the ship has kind of calmed down a little bit, and uh, we now have regular smooth meetings with good dialogue and discussion, and I, I love smooth meetings, I think most of us do. So um, I will be vacating this position, and uh, I'd like to make a recommendation for the new chair and vice chair. That would be that the chair of the RTC next year will be uh, Supervisor Bruce McPherson, and the vice chair will be uh, Councilman from Watsonville, Aurelio Gonzalez. So I'd like a, a motion with that, if we can. So moved. I'll second. second. Motion by Leopold, second by Schifrin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Carries unanimously. So with that, um, we're gonna move on to item uh, 22. This is a public hearing, adoption of the 2020 Regional Transportation Improvement Plan. And Rachel, you're normally already standing there, but that's okay. Ms. Sorry, Martoni, go how ahead. do you all compose Corey's uh, thing? Made me tear up. It, that's okay. It's, it's We're okay together to for a long time. She's been impressive. So, anyway, I'll try to compose. Okay. Um, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for um, being here today, and so many members of our community who are um, always involved, and we really appreciate everyone's input. So, before you today is a proposal for programming some of the funds that this agency has discretion over. Um, overall, of all the funding sources that come into Santa Cruz County, this board has discretion over about 5% of the funds that are available. These funds, though, are very critical to addressing some of our backlog of needs in our community, and so the work you do today is important to all of our um, constituents, visitors, businesses. Um, so. At your September 5th meeting, and as discussed at your June board meeting, the commission established a process for selecting projects to receive funds this cycle. Um, within that action, the commission determined that it would um, designate most of the region's regional service transportation program um, exchange funds, which are a state funding source that is exchanged from federal funds, mostly to local jurisdictions on a population basis with a minimum with a minimum of 5% of the funds to go to each of the local jurisdictions. Before you today is a proposal for 17 projects for about 10 million of that regional surface transportation program exchange funds for metro, city, and county projects. Santa Cruz Metro has proposed to use 200,000 of the funds that were um, designated for metro to replace paracruz vans. This is um, essential for them to be able to maintain their existing services for people who are unable to utilize the fixed route system. Um, local jurisdictions have proposed to repave several roads in the county, actually in total about 75% of the projects proposed by local jurisdictions include roadway rehabilitation, um, resurfacing, and other pavement management. There's also a proposal from the city of Santa Cruz to add some additional funding for the Highway 1 and 9 intersection, which is a critical intersection, providing access to uh, the city of Santa Cruz, utilized to provide access to the university, to businesses, especially in the Harvey West area. Um, all of the metro transit vehicles go through that intersection. Um, and provides access to downtown Santa Cruz and the west side. There's also several projects on the project list that include bicycle and pedestrian components. These include sidewalk improvements in Scotts Valley, green bike lanes and trails in the city of Watsonville, the Highway 152 and Holohan Road intersection in the county, um, which also provides access to schools in that area, um, Aptos Village projects, and um, in Davenport to, um, add funding for a pedestrian crosswalk there as discussed at your last meeting. In addition to the funds, the RSTP exchange funds for that Davenport project, the staff recommendation includes $125,000 of Measure D funds from the um, trail component of Measure D to add to that project. The bicycle committee 
and your other committees reviewed all of these recommendations at their um, November meeting and recommend all of the projects that are proposed before you today on attachment two. But the bicycle committee also additionally has recommended that the commission ensure that project sponsors consider installing sharrows and or three feet to pass signage on any roadways that do not have bicycle facilities. And so we've included that in that recommendation in the resolution. Um, as discussed at your past board meetings, we also have recommended um, utilizing the majority of the regional discretionary funds that remain the State Transportation Improvement Program and Highway Improvement Program funds on Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane projects. Specifically in the staff recommendation, we are recommending utilizing 6.5 million of those STIP and HIP funds for the Highway 1 41st Avenue to SoCal Avenue Auxiliary Lanes, Bus on Shoulders, and Chanticleer Bike Ped Bridge Project. This is a slight change from what was initially in the staff report and you have a replacement page showing that we are wanting to utilize those um, HIP funds as quickly as possible and get that project to construction and maximize the amount of match that we're showing for a competitive grant that we plan on applying to the California Transportation Commission for next year. We've also included $169,000 in STIP funds, which are the amount that's available to meet state and federal planning, programming, and monitoring requirements. And um, with that, I just wanted to note that we've also handed out several comments from the public that were received. The comments generally comment on some of the specific projects. There are some folks who are very supportive of projects in the project list shown in an attachment to. There are some um, folks who recommend the commission not fund a few of those projects. And some members of the community have recommended that the commission look at funding alternate projects that are not on the list. Um, regarding the State Transportation Improvement Program funds, these are funds that the Commission has um, discretion over telling the state how we want to see those funds programmed, but ultimately the California Transportation Commission makes the final determination on what year those funds are programmed and whether or not to fund the projects as we propose. So we have asked for the funds on this project that is gonna be ready to go to construction in 2021 um, but unfortunately, most of the new capacity for the State Transportation <coughs> Improvement Program is out in fiscal year um, mm -hmm. 23 through 25. And so if the CTC is not able to accommodate our request to put those funds on this project and not result in project delays, the um, staff recommendation also includes authorizing staff to shift those funds to an alternate auxiliary lane project if necessary to ensure that our region maintains those funds. Additionally, in attachment three, you have a couple recommendations for amendments to previously programmed projects. These include um, updating project schedules, so moving some of the funds out to later years, shifting funds between some projects, and updating um, scope information on those projects. So today, we recommend that you hold a public hearing. It has been advertised in newspapers and sent out to thousands of people that have asked for updates on our activities. Um, and then to adopt the resolution, which is attachment A and exhibit, um, which is attachment one, and um, which includes exhibit A and B, attachments two and three, regarding the specific projects that we recommend funding and um, those amendments. Projects that are programmed to receive regional surface transportation program exchange funds can begin immediately. We do have the cash available. Um, some project sponsors are not gonna be able to start their projects actually until next fiscal year or the year after just due to staffing constraints or their current project schedules, but um, several of them are planning on getting going on those funds immediately. And then any projects with bike and pedestrian or transit components will be reviewed by our elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee and our bicycle committee in order to give them an opportunity to provide input before the final designs are done. Um, and with that, we recommend that the commission open the public hearing. I do wanna just note that several of the project sponsors are here if you have specific pro questions about specific projects. Any questions of uh, Ms. Marconi? I open the public. Go ahead, Ms. Um, it could perhaps be a little bit more of a comment um, because we, we've got this, uh, the extra packet items, especially with the comments from the public. 
and I don't know if the public are here that have emailed this as well, but if maybe staff could provide us with a little bit of history on some of these comments or projects that we don't have that they've made comment about, just so that we have an idea of, I, I don't know if they've been looked at and they've been you know ruled out or they're further down on the list, just so that we know where to stand with um, the kinds of comments that we're receiving, that would be helpful for me to to know because I don't have time to read these and I may not know that they've mm -hmm. been considered or not considered. Sh um, I could do that now or we could do that after the public hearing and, and look at all the comments at the same time, yeah, whichever you would like. So let's do that. Okay, sure. So no, no questions this time. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing and uh, anyone from the public would like to come up and speak on this item. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Commission. Um, my name is Pauline Seals. I'm with Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. Um, I was going to specifically ask you to reconsider the Orcs Lanes project and alternately consider strongly bus on shoulder and rapid transit along Soquel Avenue. There are several reasons for doing this. One of them that recently came to me was that Measure D was a package. And uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday who said, yeah, I didn't want to vote for the Orcs Lanes, but I wanted to vote for the other four things. And so we do not have a reading from the county clearly on whether they wanted that or not. Um, so as a reminder about that. Recently, several things have happened. Caltrans now has quite different guidelines, whereas forever they were pushing more usage, and I'm not using the right words, but getting more um, cars along, getting them moving faster, and they have completely backed off from that and now taking a whole different look at transportation because, frankly, they realize it's not working. Um, that's number one. And number two is the governor's directive N 1919, where he specifically said, take another look at transportation, simply encouraging cars is the wrong way to go. And I'm not using the correct terminology, but you get the idea. So I think in view of all of those factors, the fact that the public truly did not vote for Auxlane specifically, um, there are two new directives, it would make sense to look at the funds, $109 million or so something like that, um, look at what is the best environmentally friendly, people friendly, poor people friendly way to use those funds to improve the commute, specifically from Watsonville. Um, so I just ask you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Rick Longinati from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. So there are two projects in there that I'd like to ask you to remove, and they're both uh, what I think uh, could qualify what Aileen Lowe called old school highway expansion projects. And old school meaning the, the idea that somehow by expanding capacity on a highway, we're gonna solve congestion. That's been proved to be false. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you've ever been to Southern California, you know that for a fact, or even the Bay Area. Um, the Highway 1 expansion, the auxiliary lanes and the ramp metering were in, were studied by an EIR that came out in 2015, and it said that in the southbound direction, after you've built auxiliary lanes from Santa Cruz all the way down to Freedom Boulevard, and you've done ramp metering, that in the evening commute, there would be greater delay than the no-build project. So we're not, we're, you know, this, this application for state funding, for state grant money, doesn't look very good if the project that you're asking for is not accomplishing congestion relief. But worse than that, it creates more vehicle miles traveled and more greenhouse gas emissions. The other project, which is the Santa Cruz request for Highway 1 and 9, old school. Already, it, it, already that intersection is huge. It's eight lanes in one direction on Highway 1, five lanes in the other direction on River Street. This would make it even bigger. Whenever you make intersections bigger, you make them more intimidating for bicyclists and pedestrians. But it's gonna have a marginal impact, if any, on congestion relief 
but it, it, according to the environmental study on this intersection, it will add 10% to carbon emissions. So, you know, you, we all have one foot in the new world of sustainability, and your director attended a conference in Vancouver and came back with, you know, excitement about sustainability, and I think that is contagious. But we have one foot in the old world, the old world that's, that's gotten us to this place where greenhouse gases is going to really pummel our children and our grandchildren. So we need to get the one foot out of the old world and quit doing these old school projects. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Carrie Pico, but before I get started. Closer uh, to the I, mic, Carrie. Before I get started, I had asked for, uh, I had sent a PowerPoint to Fernanda and whether or not it's available, not available. So then I will speak without it. I'm addressing, so you can start. Sorry about that confusion. No, no, it's okay. Um, I, I didn't expect it, actually. The uh, Watsonville Rail Trail from uh, Watsonville Slough Trailhead to Ohlone Parkway is, I believe, a complete waste of funds. There are two wonderful trails surrounding the Watsonville Slough in that area, one along the residence, one on the other side. Uh, it goes the full length from Ohlone Parkway up to Kearney Street. Uh, the proposed trail would go along the railroad, which is 30 feet away from one of the trails and 40, 400 feet from the trailhead, so it's a redundant thing. And um, it's all in industrial land. It really looks awful. That's what I wanted to show pictures of. If, if you want to you know, take the worst case scenario of what a view is, uh, other than trash all over the place, it's industrial, and it's not pleasant. If Watsonville wants to put its best face forward, they should Im uh, insist on having people use the trails that are in existence now. They have a wonderful trail network that I've used. I've run around it quite a bit. Um, and um, at 1,500 feet, that's one, you know, that's a pretty short distance. $1.6 million for that short trail, that's $5.5 million. So as you hear, I'm very fiscally focused. That's really my issue. And then since uh, I'm, I'm done with that, other than I wish you would not continue with this trail and you put some sanity into, uh, uh, one last thing I should say about the trail. There's no connection there. And if you think there's going to be a connection somewhere else, it's not. The, the uh, bike trail comes up on Beach Street. So nobody's going to go out of their way to go do that short little section. Build it if you ever need it in the future. Now as to uh, the Highway 1 widening traffic issue, my suggestion is, and this is, un you can't do anything about it, put your investment into Watsonville, build up the business there, have the reverse commute, then you'll take traffic away. I know it's not gonna happen, but in a real world, in a dream world, you put jobs where, jobs where uh, you have an easy commute to, this way, it's just a pass through to Silicon Valley without jobs. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jessica Evans from the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you for holding this hearing. Um, according to the projections on page 14 of the uh, Association of Monterey Bay Area Governor's final environmental impact report for the 2040 Metropolitan Transportation Plan, slash sustainable communities strategy for Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz counties. In the year 2020, a little over 60% of Santa Cruz County greenhouse gas emissions are projected to be from transportation. On page 287, the greenhouse gases and climate change section of the document admits that the plan will fail badly short of meeting the currently mandated state greenhouse gas emission targets. We need to do better. We have a plan in place. It's a climate plan, it's not sufficient for the emissions reductions that we need to do to do our share of greenhouse gas reduction. So in Santa Cruz County, transportation is the biggest problem and it's the place where we can make the biggest difference. We need to fund projects that will reduce emissions and defund projects that will increase emissions. First, I, um, I want to ask you to please stop the funding for the two highway projects that will increase greenhouse gas emissions, the Auxiliary Lanes Project and Highway 1 and, and 9 intersection widening projects. According to the Caltrans EIR and Highway 1 projects, the Ox Lane Project would cause a 25% increase in greenhouse gases, resulting from the TSM alternative relative to the no-build alternative by the year 2035. That's not a price we can afford to pay. 
We are in a climate emergency and we need to do better. Expansion of the intersection of Highway 1 and Highway 9 would also increase emissions about 10%. But, you know, that's not the only cost of that project. This project is being proposed at a time when the State Office of Traffic Safety rated Santa Cruz number one in the rate of injuries to bicyclists in each of the years 2013 to 2016 out of 104 cities of similar size. We are rated an average of 11, oh, number 11 over those years in rate of injuries to pedestrians. To reduce the deaths and injuries of pedestrians and bicyclists, we need to build active transportation infrastructure. This costs money. The RTIP for this intersection widening project requests $2 million in RSTPX funds and to transfer an additional 188,000 in already programmed funds to the project. These are funds that could otherwise be used to make streets safer for cyclists and pedestrians in the city of Santa Cruz. This proposal also plans to use over $4 million in local traffic impact fees, which is pretty much the whole fund, which again would prevent these funds from being used for bike and in pedestrian infrastructure. You need to wrap up, please. I will. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. I know it's long. We just, the bottom line is we need to do better. These projects are these legacy projects. We can't afford to continue doing these projects. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yesenia, can I ask you? Old school, sorry. Nothing wrong with old school. Go ahead and bring that in. Hi, Thank you. I'm old school. Um, hi, I'm Noel Bach from Davenport. I'm the 30-year um, re resident of Davenport and the chairperson of the Davenport North Coast Association, and I'm here to address the construction of a safe highway access, uh, crossing in Davenport. You know, I'm sure many of you have been up to Davenport to go to Whale City for breakfast and enjoy our beautiful little community there. But crossing the highway is very, very dangerous. Um, due to a lack of visibility, there's an incline as you drive through. And in fact, a child was tra tragically killed a couple of years ago because the driver couldn't see her with the sun coming in his eyes and the incline. So. As you'll see with the photographs I'm passing around, drivers park anywhere. There's no established parking area, which makes for confusion and congestion in Davenport. Adding to the danger, people are not um, heating the 40 mile an hour, um, uh, and that's not enforced. Um, Pacific School would like, teachers would like to take their children to the outdoor classroom, the beach, the ocean, but it's too dangerous to cross the highway. I and other residents of Davenport would love to take our grandchildren for a walk on the beach, but it's too scary to cross the highway. So I'm urging the RTC to provide funding for the final design and construction of a Highway 1 crossing in Davenport and not wait until the rail trail project unfolds. We cannot afford any more almost misses or fatalities in Davenport. Um, we need the project of a safe crossing from the ersatz parking area to the business district as soon as possible, preferably before this summer. So I thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Can I, uh, go ahead. Is it gonna be delayed or we're gonna, I, I think we're ready to go on that Davenport uh, crossing, right? Yes, right now, uh, Central Federal Lands that's um, doing the work on design of the rail trail project is um, uh, designing also the crosswalk as part of that project and working with Caltrans on getting the uh, uh, necessary encroachment permit. And that project can be broken off and built separately quicker if um, uh, we can get approvals in, in a matter that would, would allow it to do so. Okay, so that uh, answers part of the question there. We can do it earlier. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Preston. Go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Good, no, that's fine. Good morning, my name is Bob Morgan. I'm a county resident, I live in Live Oak. Um, I agree with the speakers bef that have spoken before me that widening highways does not solve congestion issues. The Katy Freeway in Houston, which was expanded to 24 lanes, 12 in each direction, in the 1990s, is 
congested bumper to bumper traffic during peak hours. The solution to Highway 1 will never be solved. Highway 1 will always be congested during peak hours, no matter how wide you build the freeway. This is because of a very interesting psychological phenomenon called induced travel. Many of you know about that phenomenon. It is driving behavior which um, motivates people, it's behavior which motivates people to take up a vacuum if they perceive open lanes anywhere, they will become motivated to use those lanes. So I recommend not funding an expansion program for Highway 1 auxiliary lanes. Instead, I recommend bus on shoulder. I recommend alternatives. I recommend not expanding vehicle miles traveled, which increases greenhouse gas emissions. And as Jeff Jessica mentioned, we are not on track to meet our greenhouse gas emissions through vehicle miles traveled decreases in the state of California. Vehicle miles traveled continue to increase. Greenhouse gas emissions due to those vehicle miles traveled continue to increase. So as long as we continue to expand highways, we will induce drivers to congest those highways. I urge you to not fund further expansion of that highway, nor the intersection at Highway 9 and Highway 1. Thank you. Thank you. Morning once again, uh, Michael Saint. Um, <clears throat> pretty much everything's been said already. Um, you're old for seven, but I'll try to continue the discussion. Um, under item 22, page two, under discussion, it says the project's being funded improve access, traffic flow safety, reduces VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. I think the previous speakers have summarized that, and that's not a, an actual true statement. I think saying these things, VM, VMT and greenhouse gas emission is kind of just the cool thing to do. Um, so let's throw it in, in, in the agenda items and hopefully that it'll fly. Uh, basically, it's all incorrect. Um, I did a, some type of a little uh, discovery. I did go through attachments one, two, and three on the money and the projects. You do have some very positive things going on there. Um, tried to generally add up the funds. Um, roads and highways out of the, that funding are getting approximately $15.5 million. I realize a lot of that's due to resurfacing and that is necessary. Um, and the TDM's getting approximately $2 million. I was kind of surprised at the amount of money going towards TDM. Most of that in, in uh, Mr. Caput's area in his district. Um, my suggestion is that should be flipped. TDM should be receiving the majority of these funds and anything to do with other transportation like Highway 1, a bus on shoulder, dedicated, much less expensive than ox lanes could be starting to be funded with the lower income and getting the planning done for that. That's about the only thing that's going to get this county moving in the next five to seven years is you open up those shoulders, buses 10 to 15 minutes, you get more buses from Metro, hopefully electric, and people will eventually look at that as advertisement and see why are these buses going 15 to 20 miles an hour faster than me and I'm still sitting in traffic. It's a, parad a paradigm shift that needs to take place. And if we don't do it now, you're gonna give it to the next generation to do it for you. And they're gonna look back at this group and say, why didn't we start this mass transit sooner? I feel you're using these terms uh, incorrectly, VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this funding re uh, request, in my opinion, will actually increase both of these, as Rick Longinati stated and gave examples of your own UCIS um, study. Recommend RTC not adopt this 2020 TIP funding program. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. David Date, La Selva Beach. Um, VMT is associated with greenhouse gas, but as cars are parked on the highway, greenhouse gas approach affinity, VMT goes to zero. So that, that is a important distinction when you're trying to draw this analysis, that if we reduce VMT and we park cars on the road, well, that's not actually reducing greenhouse gas. So that's very important. So right now we have gridlock traffic, GHG, or greenhouse, greenhouse gas goes to infinity, vehicle miles traveled is almost zero. 
So that's, that's an important distinction that I think all these groups need to make for a sustainable campaign for transportation, like, duh. Um, another, thing, another thing that is important to recognize is that autonomous vehicles are probably two years out. My friend just got a Model 3. He doesn't have a option to buy at the end of his lease because these are gonna become autonomous fleet cars. So this is happening right now. We don't have any infrastructure to accommodate this revolution in transportation. So we need to have a little bit of foresight, two years, not 2035, two years this is happening. If we don't have an HOV lane to accommodate these vehicles, we are going to miss out on this revolution. Um, maybe there's one other thing. BMT, greenhouse gas, induced demand. These models are derived from LA, Houston. These are huge grid cities. We are a linear city. It's only a mile wide. So we have three corridors. We've got SoCal, Sumner's turned into its own little corridor. So our induced demand is shared between essentially three roads, not a grid. So these models do not apply to Santa Cruz as they would for LA, Houston. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples, Executive Director of Trail Now. I, I just first want to concur with what David um, had mentioned about autonomous cars and the fact that we're having a lot of more emissions because our main corridor is clogged. And so, you know, and, and if you remember Measure D voters, one of the main reasons we won Measure D, which we support it, was to open up the highway corridor. The public voted for it, so you can't turn your back on that. Um, and as a surf uh, active transportation organization, we believe that opening up the, the highway corridor will reduce surface street congestion, and it'll make our surface streets, our neighborhoods safer. We need to stop people from doing those cut-throughs. We need to stop it, and the only way we can do it is open up that corridor. So people traveling from the Bay Area to Monterey, they don't cut through, they, you know, we deal with that. We have to open it up and deal with the surges. What is it, six hours of delay now is what that highway is at, and that's, that's, that's even worse than the Bay Area. Uh, traffic. Now, of course, the interesting thing that we advocate for, that we're really concerned with, um, and we hear from the No Widen group, is is opening up the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail. Right now, it's being held by the same people who don't want to widen the highway. They're holding it hostage. They're not allowing that corridor to be used today. So, we're asking that we continue to focus on opening the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail as soon as possible. Because if you look at the, universe, the, the Unified Corridor Study, it showed that corridor, when it becomes a world-class trail designed as a transportation trail, which separates pedestrians from fast-moving users, it will reduce Highway tr 1 traffic. It will make an impact because what the study showed is you're going to have 800 users an hour. And that's, if you look at the equation, a single highway lane is 2,000 people an hour. So you have those three corridors, Soquel, Highway 1, and the trail corridor. Think about that. You're opening up this main artery. And that's the way we solve Watsonville's traffic today, is we get the, that central core section, people not having to do those three mile drives, they can use that trail. 800 people using that an hour will reduce that impact. You know, Greg, you talk about the metering ramps. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So the same thing with our trail. It will reduce traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sally Arnold, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, I just want to correct a misstatement made by the previous speaker. Friends of the Rail and Trail takes no position on highway widening at all. There are various, you know, individuals within Friends of the Rail and Trail have multiple different positions on that, but Friends of the Rail and Trail does not have a position on that. And so, just to be clear, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dana Bagshaw. I 
happily live in Santa Cruz without a car. I walk, ride my bike, and I take the bus. Um, I'm not here with a solution. I, I think that there's a lot of different things that have been said. Um, I'm, I'm here for the framework of that solution. We need to look to the future, and the future does not look good. So we need to set a, a number one priority in, in all our planning that we reduce carbon emissions and curb this climate change that's killing us. So um, I ask you to not spend another penny on infrastructure that supports the cars. Yes, maintenance, yes, let's maintain what we've got, but let's not do any more building. Let's work on the infrastructure for pedestrians, for bicycles, and for the metro. And let's look to the future, too, to see what effects climate change is going to have on us. If we're going to have sea level rising, does it make sense to build transportation on the ground next to the coast? We've got to think hard about these things. And so I beg of you to start looking to the future and making decisions that make sense for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Keith Otto. So I and others in my community do support investments in Highway 1, so aux lanes, HOV lanes, and such, and that is part of your plan. Even if those do not deliver on congestion relief, they will at least offer increased capacity, which is sorely needed. It'll also reduce the traffic that currently flows through neighborhoods. It'll also enable express bus service, and it'll also promote ride sharing and carpooling. In addition, it will be a resource for public safety. I don't know how many of you this morning were traveling from the south to this meeting. There was an ambulance, sirens on, lights flashing, trying to make its way presumably to Dominican. And it was quite an interesting thing to see as that ambulance was trying to make its way through all the Highway 1 traffic. Something like an HOV lane um, down the road, Ox lanes sooner, right, provides an additional resource for our public safety, um, our, our public safety assets. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, Gina Cole, Executive Director at Bike Santa Cruz County. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, I, when, I'm sorry, I'm running a little late because I rode the bus in this morning. Um, but not that the bus was running late, the bus was, bus was perfectly on time, but that it was, it was on me because I didn't want to drive by myself in a single passenger car. Um, one of the things that I want you all to, to consider is maybe think a little bit about what Watsonville did with their planning commission um, just on Tuesday, and they held off on a um, on a development that would have two drive-throughs, and one of the big reasons behind having two of the drive-throughs was that it, it was a car-centric development. It was also the fact that all those cars are gonna sit and wait, and that's what happens here. We sit and we wait. Um, folks that spoke were very adamant about looking to our future um, and creating a more, a more sustainable world, and we say this over and over and over, and the reason that we do is because it's important. Um, we can't continue to use our gas cars, and that we have to have alternatives to a gasoline-powered um, existence, and we need to shift our mindset from being so dependent on our cars to go from place to place. And to do that, we need to create infrastructure that makes it doable for folks to walk and to ride their bikes and to access public transportation that is going to be a less impactful um, method of transportation throughout our county. We're not a really, really big county, but we do have spread out places, and we do have folks that aren't, don't have access unless they do have an automobile to, from where they live out 
out of the, the regular circles of our, of our jurisdictions to where they work, where they play, where they shop. Um, I, I, for one, am, am trying very, very hard to not use a car. We're down to one car for my whole family. Um, and it's not easy. It's really not easy to consider, given the weather this week, what that rain looked like, and how am I going to get milk home, um, and how am I how am I going to do that? But we need to be creating this next generation of folks that think differently than we do. Um, that is why it's really important for us to set the example for the young people who are trying really damn hard to set the example for us. So when we stop and listen to the facts that, that they're presenting, that they want a more sustainable world, that they want to be able to ride their bikes in a safe way, they want to be able to walk to where they can go, they want to be able to live where they work, where they play, where they go to school, we need to create a a plan that honors that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good, good morning, thanks for this opportunity. My name is uh, Benjamin Ketchum. I live in Live Oak. Um, I didn't plan to sp uh, make comments this morning, but I realize I better take the opportunity. That's what this is for, uh, so thank you. Uh, my short point is to echo uh, speakers from uh, before me that talked about sustainability. Um, I think it's true still, and I've, I've read that the train part of the r rail trail proposal is still categorized as a diesel locomotive style train, which um, sounds like the opposite of sustainability and absolutely contributes to emissions. Um, my uh, advocacy is for using that space for a healthy, uh, pass, uh, passenger uh, passageway opportunities, biking and walking and wheelchairs and eventually some electronic kinds of uh, transportation um, because it's sitting there. It seems like it's been sitting there for a long time. I remember taking a survey, it feels like 15 years ago, would you like to ride a train once in a while from here to there in Santa Cruz? I said, sure, sounds like fun, uh, but I don't really see the pragmatics and I would love to know how many residents actually took that survey way back then uh, because it doesn't seem uh, sensible to me uh, in a very logistical kind of a way. I would also say that if the, that space was open to, uh, to a more, uh, to, to uh, biking and walking, et cetera, today, uh, the surface having uh, uh, the rails pulled out altogether could then be converted perhaps to a battery powered bus kind of a system or something solar powered in the future if we needed a little more capacity to, to, tra to travel more people. Um, so to me, you're not closing down that option, but a diesel locomotive sounds ridiculous, and I think it should be transparent and continue to be transparent to the public that that's still what's on the, uh, what's being uh, considered. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning again, commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer with more than three decades of experience. I want to support the staff recommendation that you go ahead and adopt the 2020 Transportation Improvement Program. And I know that there are many controversial things in the program, but taken as a whole, this, uh, trans this uh, Transportation Improvement Program will do a lot of good things in our county. It will improve pedestrian safety. It will improve cyclist safety. Um, it's going to enable a bus on shoulder program that frankly would never happen if it weren't for the auxiliary lanes. I have studied the bus on shoulder program. I've looked at the drawings, I've looked at the plan, and that plan depends on the construction of auxiliary lanes, especially the auxiliary lanes that go from Sea Cliff, uh, from State Park Drive out to Freedom, where that freeway is without shoulder at all. Um, I also want to um, mention the um, Davenport Crossing. Um, that is a, a hot spot in our county for uh, safety. And this uh, transportation improvement program includes funding for that crosswalk. Um, that area sees massive numbers of people from out of our community that are not as smart as we are and don't understand how dangerous it is to cross Highway 1 right there. And uh, anything we can do to enhance the safety of not only ourselves, but the people who come and visit us, come to whale watching, uh, this is, this is, these are the tourists. 
and our last time I checked, our economy depends on tourism. So um, again, I urge you to support the uh, proposed transportation improvement program. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public like to address us on this topic? Come on up. Hi, I'm Robert Esposito, and I've been to a few of these meetings now, and um, uh, I'm from Aptos. And uh, there's just one rail, and I don't really see how uh, you can have an effective commuter uh, system uh, just using one rail, and uh, I, nobody's really been mentioning that uh, the whole time. And um, so <coughs> I, I really can't, I haven't been able to wait for the trail to uh, open. So me and my family, we've been riding it on our mountain bikes, and uh, it's just too bumpy, and you just need to throw some dirt or something on top of the tracks uh, to open up that corridor. Uh, I know uh, <coughs> a lot of children have uh, trouble getting to school on the um, uh, New Brighton Middle School, and just to just getting the school traffic off of the highway it makes a huge improvement. So, <coughs> from my experience, riding on that trail. You're not competing with uh, impatient drivers who are high on coffee, and uh, and it's just it's just dangerous for uh, for for children. My my son, who's uh, ten years old, <coughs> I, I don't really want him riding on the streets. And I got to say, the air, like not having to deal with cars, it's. It's magnificent, and uh, it's 100% inspirational. It's very inspiring, and that's what we need is 100% inspiration if we're going to uh, really take on this uh, global uh, carbon uh, crisis. Um, thank, thank you for uh, listening to me, thank you. Thanks, thank you for your comments. Good morning. Good morning, this is set up for 12 people. I'm CJ, I live right in between cities, Soquel and Santa Cruz, I'm over there on Thurba Lane, which is very beautiful. I take the bus a lot. And I work with seniors and have since I was knee high to a grasshopper. And the buses are nice and wonderful and I'm always impressed that so many people put their bicycles on there. Sometimes there's people that leave early so someone who's going a longer distance can have the space for the bike. But what I wanna talk about is the safety of both the bikes and the walking. Sidewalks, we don't have enough sidewalks and when I have seniors that call me because they've g had to give up their licenses, they can no longer drive, it's not a choice. They're scared to take the bus and they're scared to walk because they'll have to cross a street where there's not a ramp if they're you know, carrying stuff to set them down. They can't um, rely on the time to get across the street when the, you press to walk and it goes 10, 9, 8, 7, and they're halfway through. So we have a lot of issues about making it more pedestrian friendly. And because the graying of America is happening, I've been working on this since before I was a senior, uh, we need to be mindful that the more seniors we have, the more friendly the walk needs to be. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kristen Rogus. I'm from Davenport, uh, general manager of Whale City Bakery. I have a front row seat to the pedestrian crossing problem there. Um, I'm here to urge you to approve funding for this package, uh, but um, I also want to urge you, if at all possible, to do this crossing, pedestrian crossing in Davenport as independently as possible so that we can 
get it done as soon as possible because it's a, it's a rather urgent problem. Davenport's overrun with people now. People are crossing everywhere. Um, drivers are missing them. People are getting killed. People are getting hit. Um, I think this, if we could get this pedestrian crossing going as soon as possible, uh, we can avoid another fatality. Uh, it'll also be better for the drivers that are coming down Highway 1. It will make it much more clear that people are crossing and that they have to watch out for them and they have to stop for them. And uh, as it is now, they're just crossing down by the roadhouse, they're crossing up north of the parking lot, they're crossing in front of Whale City, and it's, it's really an urgent, urgent problem. And I, I really hope that you guys take this up right away. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Barry Scott, Aptos. Um, I, I want to, I, <clears throat> I read on social media and I read uh, the letters to the editor and I hear my neighbors uh, speak to a couple of things and I, and I thought I might add some information that might be helpful about <coughs> rail vehicle technologies and uh, whether or not these would be diesel. I think the staff and maybe most of you know that the Unified Corridor Investment Study used uh, the existing studies, the 2013-2015 passenger rail feasibility study that included a diesel uh, multiple unit type of vehicle. But we've had speakers, and including our own uh, uh, past executive director, who spoke to the likelihood that uh, rail vehicles would be electric, and, and more specifically battery electric. Um, we had a presentation from Kyle Grattinger. Uh, I've spoken to Chad Edison with, with the state. Uh, and there's just every, every reason to, to expect that the rail vehicles that'll be available at the time that we implement service would be light and battery operated, perhaps similar to what uh, our demonstration project is gonna, is gonna um, demonstrate to us. Uh, as regards single track, um, and, and I've looked over and over again at different systems, the Sprinter in Santa Cruz, the, uh, I mean, the Sprinter in San Diego, the Smart Train, and using a single track is common. You use passing sidings to accommodate, uh, and, and tr uh, rail vehicles going in different directions are dispatched in a way that prevents collisions, and you don't need double tracks, but it's easy to, for people to think, uh, how, how on earth could you do a single track bi-directional train? So, there are solutions to all these things in it, but but they're not they're not apparent uh, to the to the you know the the light reader on this, and I'll I'll add one one more thing I, I'm I'm uh, I don't brag about it, but I am proud of the fact that in 2010 I uh, applied for grants and created a Clean Transportation Technologies Academy. We worked with the ACE train, the Stockton to San Jose train. They're a sponsor. AECOM, which is a -E -com, which is a, like a Bechtel size uh, organization, engineering firm, uh, was working on the Altamont Corridor Express and high speed rail uh, ideas, and they were the sponsors for a high school academy that I founded for uh, clean transportation technology. So I've been looking at rail transit for that long. It's not a, like a hobby, it's part of the work I do. And uh, so I thank you guys for all the work you do, and I'm excited about. Uh, the work that uh, is coming soon. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Nina. I live in Lyle. Speak into the microphone so we can hear you, okay? Thank you. My name's Nina. I live in Live Oak. Shout out to Mr. Leopold. Um, I've already sent you a letter, a detailed letter we could send out. Uh, ahead beforehand, but I've been listening to a lot of people talking, uh, for example, about Davenport. I'm a cyclist primarily, except for when I used to work. I worked at Kaiser, so I drove, but I'm trying to take the load off the rest of the people who can't stop driving. Um, I do cycle up to Davenport. That is treacherous, but I also cycle uh, the roads all over in town. Thank you for all the work you've done. Um, making it safer for us, making our community aware of bicycles, because I do 
um, go into certain areas in uh, California where you can tell people aren't really uh, used to seeing cyclists around. So thank you very much for all the work you do. Um, I guess what I wanna say is we have a, a, a track and whatever we decide to do with it in the future, that asset is already there. So why don't we take care of it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else from the public like to address us? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the uh, pu public hearing and bring it back for discussion. Anyone else would like to begin? Commissioner Bertrand. I, I listened to some comments about the uh, trail proposal and art support near the Watsonville area. Um, aren't we working with Watsonville? Um, because we did have a presentation, uh, I believe, from the, uh, the streets person from Watsonville talked about how they're going to integrate their um, trails with our trail proposal. So it's just any comments on that? Good morning, Commissioner. So um, within the staff recommendations is a recommendation for an additional $600,000 for segment 18 of the trail network as well as on attachment three, there's an amendment to the scope of um, segment 18 and what the funds are gonna be used for immediately. Um, Murray Fonts, who is the project manager for the trail project in Watsonville is here if you have specific questions, but generally, um, Watsonville has spent the last two decades building up its trail network and has um, plans to integrate trails over Lee Road. They're working with the county on and the land trust on how to develop that, which would also integrate into the um, proposed segment 18 uh, rail trail once it's completed, linking folks to downtown, the Ohlone Parkway residences, um, and then there's other trails as well, but if, if the commission would like a future presentation on their trail network um, annually when we meet in Watsonville, um, they do oftentimes provide that. But if you have specific questions, I'd like to defer to Watsonville staff. Yeah, maybe one question, thank you. Sure. Morning, Murray. Good morning. Thank you for being here from Watsonville to here. Um, so my sense is we're adding capacity besides a beautiful corridor. Uh, Wattsville uh, corridors, I've been on them, but to me, I don't see the capacity sense that this uh, proposal is gonna do. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Is my take correct? The segment of trail that we're discussing is segment 18 of the rail trail. It extends the entire project, the entire segment extends from the city limits at Lee Road into the downtown area at the intersection of Beach and Walker Street. The city is proposing to construct a portion of that. We're phasing our project because of permit requirements and other delays, we were unable to build it all at once. So when we look at this one segment in and of itself, it doesn't appear to add capacity. We did have to go to the California Transportation Commission to receive approval of the funding. And what we did was we portrayed it in the manner that we see it, and it's a regional trail. We're building a segment at this time. When it's completely built out, it will extend a link to the southeast side of town, which currently isn't linked to any trails except through sidewalks. And yes, it does need to go through an industrial corridor to get there. But if we don't do that, we won't reach them. It will end at Lee Road, and as Rachel mentioned, Lee Road extends out into the county, and we're gonna partner with the county and with the land trust to develop a trail along Lee Road that will allow access to land trust property. We'll also provide alternative access to Pajaro Valley High School, and then trails will eventually leap, loop back into the city. So it will create transportation opportunities for pedestrians and bikes. It will create vistas that are inaccessible currently for those individuals, but we're doing it in segments. As you can. Thank you very much. Sure. Murray, Murray, Murray. Oh, don't go away. Yes. Uh, yes, before you go, can you um, elaborate a little bit more of why we need to do this segmentally because of some of the restrictions and that process, because uh, obviously if you're looking at 1,500 linear feet in the middle of something and they're going, well, there's nothing, there's there's nowhere from point A to point B, 
segmentally, it's because of what reason? We had originally intended to build the entire 6,400 foot segment. When we began to design it, we recognized that there were four crossings, four rail crossings through which we need to get a permit from the California Public Utilities Commission. Two of them are new crossings. We're going across spurs that don't have pedestrian or bike trails. Recently, the CPUC changed the rules and said, we need to allow a year and a half for those permits to be secured because they need to be reviewed by an administrative law judge. That was an oversight on our part, but we still need to address that. So we carved out a segment of the trail that we could build that didn't require any crossings, and we're now moving ahead with acquiring the, we're preparing the documents we need to, to submit the applications to secure the permits. And this is part of a 33 mile trail system that we've adopted and we're annually um, improving. Thanks, Tina, for that question. It helps me understand it better. Thank you for your response. Thank, thank you, Mr. Barnes, for clarifying all that. Commissioner Brown. I have some questions um, related to the transfer, the proposed amendment to transfer funds from the, for the city of Santa Cruz, uh, Frederick and Soquel project to the Highway 19 project. So I understand, and I've communicated with uh, Mr. Schneider, but since you're here, I, I do have some follow-up questions. Um, <clears throat> I understand that there are issues, right of way and cost issues related to the Frederick Soquel uh, intersection project. Um, however, I also understand that there is widespread community support and, and people have been waiting for those bike improvements to happen on Frederick. And um, so given that that's been a community priority, I'm wondering if you could, uh, if I could ask, if, can the Frederick Street um, bike lane improvements, that portion of the pr proposed project um, be implemented independently of the um, intersection issues relate that require the right of way, um, uh, settlement of the right of way issues with PG&E. So that's kind of my w one question, is it possible to do the portions of the project that are, are possible before resolving that? Um, and if not, why not? Uh, good morning, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works uh, with City of Santa Cruz. Um, the bikeway, the project didn't include bikeway improvements on Frederick Street. They were on Soquel to enhance the existing bike lanes and essentially to widen the intersection slightly to improve the, um, the uh, left turn lane and the through movement um, that line up a little too closely. The Frederick Street bike lane, to install bike lanes on Frederick Street requires removing parking. And that's the primary issue. And they can be done separately from this project. Um, we're not abandoning the Soquel Frederick project. It's just more expensive and more complicated than we originally uh, anticipated. And so the funds that were dedicated to the project are insufficient to meet the goal. Right. And so they're getting a little bit old. They've been around for a long time. So it's important for us to uh, spend the funds now on an existing project that's uh, gonna move forward a lot quicker. So uh, I guess I'm looking for clarification then because my understanding was that the bike lane improvements were related to the intersection but then also extending um, on down Frederick Street. The, um, so that is a project that is funded entirely separately from this? Uh, well, it's not currently funded well, um, on um, Frederick like Street. Like most of our CIP, <laughs> our capital improvement programming, yes. but. So none of that is, is funded. So this is not taking away any funding. That's correct. Other than the, the, the work that cannot be done until issues are resolved with pg and &E. Yes. And bike lanes on Frederick would, as I said, require parking removals. That could be something yes. considered by our mm -hmm. Transportation Public Works Commission in the future. Right. Okay. So it sounds like the action then to get the Frederick Street um, moving would be to go back to the city council and reaffirm that priority and ask that it be funded. And you believe that there is funding available to do that if, I think your message said that, you know, there's grant funding available and other funding for, to go back to this overall project, but could that include the bike lanes? 
I think combining the bike lanes with the intersection improvement project overly complicate the issue of the bike lanes on Frederick Street. Um, there will be funding available, grant funding in the future for transportation improvements and that we could, we would be eligible to apply for funding for SoCal Frederick or for bike lanes. Um, I don't think they need to be put together. Okay, so my, I guess my the sense I got from community members who were involved in trying to make this project happen over 10 years ago was that that was included. But so you can confirm that's not the case. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, I'd like to follow up on that one. Um, this is one that is somewhat close to my heart because my mom lived at the senior facility and was a strong advocate for this, uh, these improvements. Um, and it's a dangerous crossing, as you know, for pedestrians. And I think people at the, um, the facility, La Fasada, have been look, waiting for a while when we had testimony from one of the speakers about how scary it can be for older people to be trying to cross some of these complex intersections. So I'm concerned that um, I can understand that there are del projects have delays, we're certainly familiar with that, but I'm concerned that there's no specific uh, commitment to doing this project at a particular point in time, no timeline, no funding uh, uh, estimate. You mentioned that the price was going up, but you didn't, there doesn't seem to be a budget that we're moving to, and it just seems like in those kinds of situations, it's being put off indefinitely. And I, I think that would be very unfortunate because it is, uh, uh, at least as a pedestrian crossing, it's a very important, um, it, it's an important project for the people in that area. So what's your, you know, is there more information you can give about some kind of timeline or some kind of budget that um, could move this project along? Um, I, I think the, uh, the complication lies with the utility improvements. It's a major crossing for overhead utilities on SoCal as well as down Frederick. And there are four uh, significant utility poles on Frederick Street um, that tie in with the system. And, and we need to work with PG&E more closely, but um, this isn't a high priority for them at this point. Um, and that's really where the key lies. Um, they're right now in the middle of all their um, other uh, issues. Um, so it's been raised, I think, once we get a better sense from PG&E about when we can move forward on a design and how to solve these um, complicated issues, then we can provide an update. Well, I hope that this, you know, the city would take a more aggressive stance with PG&E in terms of trying to move this project forward. I do want to say something about the Davenport Signal Project. Uh, I appreciate the testimony that uh, has been given on that. It is a critical uh, improvement that's needed. I appreciate staff from the commission and the county and uh, recommending that money be set aside for, for the project. I think it can be uh, separated from the, um, the overall uh, rail trail project uh, going up to Davenport eventually. But uh, my sense is this is one, and I'm gonna put Eileen on the spot here, um, that it's gonna come down to Caltrans. Highway one is a Caltrans road, um, and Caltrans can be cooperative and collaborative and you know committed to make this work. Uh, as I think we saw them, um, Caltrans in terms of Highway nine, uh, willing to be <coughs> flexible and creative in terms of making improvements to the safety along Highway 9 in the Valley. I think that's what's going to be required in terms of making this project work in Davenport. There's no question that there's some complexity with this project, um, but hopefully it will be possible to move forward uh, expeditiously. Um, we're waiting on the preliminary design from the federal agency, which would hopefully be coming in the spring. The ability then to move to final design and construction, I think more than anything else is gonna depend on Caltrans. So I really wanna urge Caltrans to work cooperatively with commission staff um, and the federal people and the county to see this as a desirable project that should be done, it's necessary for public safety and uh, help make this project happen as quickly as possible. 
Uh, thank you, you wanna follow up? Go ahead. Yeah, I sorry, I just wanted to follow up on, because uh, Commissioner Schifrin asked a question that was also on my list um, related to of the plan for uh, realizing the SoCal Frederick intersection project. And um, so I would like to see some something more um, substantial in terms of how we intend to achieve that and um, kind of the process for engaging with PG&E. I think um, it clearly isn't a priority for them, but we may have an opportunity or m more than one to make clear how much of a priority it is to us. And I think that's perhaps something that our, um, the city council um, uh, might wanna look at. And so I'm, I'm trying to see if there's a way to um, kind of make this happen um, kind of here to get that commitment that we do not, that we are gonna actually come back and have some report on how this is, um, you intend to proceed um, rather than um, having a full agenda item about it. So if you have any thoughts on how we might achieve that, um, it would be great to hear those now. Sure, we'll be developing the next five-year capital improvement program for the city of Santa Cruz starting in January. And at that time, we'll um, um, include that in the CIP uh, appropriately and show how it's going to cost, how much it's gonna cost, what's involved, and what could potentially be the anticipated year that it would happen. And you can see that in comparison with all the other projects that, and grant funded projects that we'll be doing. Okay, um, thank you. Commissioner Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a couple questions. Uh, it, it was brought up that somehow uh, these action would be in conflict with the governor's order uh, around climate. And um, I'm looking to our executive director uh, to know whether in any of the conversations you've had with AMBAG, the California Transportation Commission, um, how have they looked at this uh, governor's order on climate and r with respects to road project? <clears throat> there is still a lot of work to be done on how to meet the requirements of the legislation to reduce vehicle miles traveled, how um, regional agencies are going to be expected to mitigate for increases in vehicle miles traveled. Vehicle miles traveled is now the new requirement by the state for the consideration of traffic impacts. Uh, previously, the state used to use level of service where they would look at um, the, the delay caused um, by a project um, as the traffic impact. But because of the um, legislation to reduce greenhouse gases and the following legislation to do so by reducing vehicle miles traveled, um, there has been a definitive shift in how we uh, look at transportation improvements and the impacts associated with them and all development in, in the state. Um, a lot of guidance has not been provided yet. There is going to be workshops on how um, things will have to change in the, in the future, but we've been assured by Caltrans that um, existing environmental documents and environmental clearances for projects will not be um, uh, looked at uh, negatively. We're not required right now to use vehicle miles travel, but we will be later in uh, 2020. So, uh, and maybe uh, Ms. Lowe, that's your understanding of it as well? I mean, I, I don't wanna put something forward that, that's gonna be shot down at, at the CTC. Commissioner Leopold, I, I would like to say that uh, the, well, I'd just like to reflect again what, what your executive director said, guidance is forthcoming. I think it demands that we're being more diverse and more committed to active transportation, which I believe this commission is, and which this um, program of projects helps advance. So th I believe that that is key. I believe some of these other projects that, that you have for operational improvements and that kind of thing are still important as you go forward. Um, and as we all go forward into the new structure of VMT. So I, um, I guess I'm not supposed to advise you directly, but it se doesn't seem like a big risk to me. Okay. I mean, the, the, it, it seems like the, the, the direction that you're taking and the commitment that you have to these other modes um, is sincere and um, you know, we're all gonna be l um, moving forward and migrating together on this. So. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I, I am, 
you know, we've gone to, with this uh, new style of, of doing the funding uh, for this round where we've asked jurisdictions, we've done it by formula, we've asked jurisdictions to provide us with their, uh, with their priorities. Um, and um, I, I would say that the Highway 19 thing isn't my priority, but it's the priority of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and if the city members are supporting it, then I'm gonna support it as well. Similarly with Watsonville and the question about the trail, if that's a, if that's a priority for Watsonville, um, it, it, it meets a lot of our needs. And so uh, I'm, that I, I have less problems with that. I, I think that's a, a good project. Um, I know that, that in the county, a lot of the, our work is being used to rehab uh, roads, and I can tell you that the ones in my districts, are, um, there's not enough money here, even though uh, there's almost 1.4 million, uh, because these, uh, especially these rural roads, uh, require a lot of work. Um, we're not gonna get everything done on these roads. Uh, these are priority roads uh, for me and for the people who, uh, that I represent. Uh, but it's gonna, it's very hard to stretch these dollars as far as possible. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, there was a speaker who, who was concerned about uh, seniors, sidewalks, <clears throat> lights. Uh, looks like she uh, left, uh, but uh, at SoCal and Thurber were doing a bunch of work to actually make that light uh, system work better, provide longer uh, time for people to cross the street. Um, and some of the work that we have that we're looking long term on Soquel Drive to make that a, a higher functioning um, uh, road will include, uh, include a lot of pedestrian improvements and I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm gonna be supporting this. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to talk about the fiscal leverage of these projects and I know that at one point we were really, how do we balance what we have for funding um, as a self-help county, as some of these projects come here. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how we're taking a dollar and stretching it and finding other resources so we can include projects maybe larger or to get projects done sooner as a result of leveraging our assets and our funding sources? So uh, the majority of the projects on these lists are being um, implemented by the local jurisdictions. For the ones being implemented by the RTC themselves, and that, that would primarily be the highway projects, the Highway 1 Auxiliary and Bus and Shoulder projects. Um, we have um, targeted uh, um, the uh, um, Senate Bill 1 programs for active transportation uh, program because we have bridges over Highway 1. We have looked at the solutions to congested corridor program. Um, um, because uh, the, <coughs> the project would uh, fit well within the guidelines that we've seen for that program. And we have um, uh, uh, are also looking at the local partnership uh, program funding, which provides a match to Measure D funds. Um, one of the things that we noticed when we looked at these programs and the ability to leverage is the solutions to congested corridor programs require that projects be environmentally cleared prior to um, being able to apply for the funding. So we focused on trying to get all of the projects needed um, as part of the Highway uh, 1 program of projects uh, environmentally cleared so that they would be eligible for this funding. Um, that is the best use of Measure D funds at this time. Um, and we are using the uh, STIP funds that um, are part of this action to program that on construction as a match to those uh, SB1 programs. Um, as well as the uh, HSIP funds, um, or excuse me, the, the HIP funds, the Highway um, Improvement Program funds, those federal funds, and then any formula funds that may be provided in the future as part of the local partnership program funding. So we've been very strategic about how we're doing this. Um, the next round of funding is expected early next year. Um, the uh, SoCal to uh, 41st project, um, which does have environmental clearance and is in final design right now, will be what we call shelf ready or ready to go. Those projects often receive priority. The other thing that um, is looked at is uh, the CTC wants to see innovative projects, projects that are not increasing um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles to travel without proper mitigation. 
these projects are very innovative. We are one of only two counties in the state that has legislation for bus on shoulders projects. Auxiliary lanes is not the business as usual build HOV lanes now sort of projects. It's looking at um, providing um, ways to improve the operations of the highway system in such a manner that does not include through lanes that increase <coughs> the overall highway capacity. We have spoken with CTC staff and they seem very interested in the highway program and how we are uh, setting it up to leverage these future grant opportunities. And I am very confident that by following this uh, methodology, which will be laid out in the strategic implementation plan for measure D expected later this month, that you will see that this is a very strategic way of leveraging measure D funds for future grant opportunities. It's good to hear because we definitely need to stretch the dollars. And, and one more question, and the rest I'll have comments a, a bit later if you want us to make rounds on comments. Um, <coughs> there was a, a mention about the emergency services. Will we at all look at the bus on shoulder avenue or location as a possible means for emergency vehicles such as the ambulance or police or fire at, at any point? I don't know. I mean, normally everybody pulls over to the right so that the the police fire and that the ambulance go through, but if we have that that lane available, do we or do we or will we look at that in terms of emergency services and the access for that um, bus on shoulder location for that type of um, vehicle? I am so glad that you brought that up because safety is one of the major components of these grant programs that they want to see done. Highway one is the lifeline for Santa Cruz County. If there's ever a major emergency, it's going to be used as an evacuation route, and it's also going to be used by emergency vehicles. The Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane Bus on Shoulders program not only provides the auxiliary lanes between intersections, but it also c includes shoulders adjacent to the auxiliary lanes that the emergency vehicles can use. Bet between the intersections, um, so under the overpasses and whatnot, that's where the buses will ride on the shoulders and the emergency vehicles can also use those shoulders. When you get further down the line, and it was correctly noted by some of the public speakers today, we have some of our most serious safety concerns and those are associated with no shoulders between State Park and Freedom Drive. And those are a result of those railroad bridges that um, really restrain the right of way. By replacing those railroad bridges, providing an auxiliary lane and an additional shoulder next to it, we will greatly increase the safety of the highway system, especially for emergency response vehicles. And this is something that will be looked at at grant, op grant op opportunities because it's been um, highlighted in all of the guidelines that we've seen thus far. And safety is a primary component of the Highway 1 corridor program, which is allowed by Measure D. Thank you. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak on this Highway uh, 19 intersection. I, I don't agree with that. Um, I think the money could be utilized in a better location, maybe uh, bring it back to the FedEx uh, SoCal intersection issues that they have. Uh, so with that, I, I, I agree with everything else and I look forward to the auxiliary lanes moving forward on Highway 1 and getting some of this traffic at least uh, relieved. Thanks. Hey, com Commissioner Muller, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I just want to very quickly express my gratitude to the Commission for uh, reworking our RSTPX allocation policy for the current grant cycle. Uh, what we did was we uh, directed all of the RSTPX uh, federal money to the local jurisdictions for local projects, and because of that decision, um, a project in Coralitas that uh, we've been waiting on for a long time is actually going to be built. It wouldn't have been built otherwise. Um, this decision today will provide over a million dollars uh, to the Pioneer Varnia Road project, um, and I know that people down there are very excited to finally have some relief. So thank you very much. I would move this staff recommendation. Motion by Schiff and seconded by, I missed a second. 
Yeah. Oh, second by Bertrand, great. Any other comments before I call, call the vote? Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Um, yes, I, I do wanna respond just briefly about the, uh, we don't want the auxiliary lanes, we don't want this, we don't want that. We all have to come back and first of all, we can all ha have a majority consensus that we need to do something and this is a process of doing something. We also know that this is a process of compromise. We all made compromises for a two thirds vote for this measure D funds so that we get the, the wildlife on 17, but also so that we get the auxiliary that we need at the south end for those relief um, the measures. To reduce the vehicle miles, uh, the other problem that we have here is this is a very complex, a very expensive county. And for us to say we need to move people around and have jobs and create jobs, that is part of the balance of the housing demand that we have here, as well as doing the economic drivers so that they don't have to leave the area and and be able to retain and reduce the number of miles that they're traveling because the job is close by. Watsonville's become the most affordable location within this county, and therefore that's why we have a housing community, and also why it's contributing to a, a lot of the issues that are here. So for people to say, no, we don't want auxiliary, the voters have decided that that's what they want. We've been confirming that, we've been processing that, we've been moving those type of projects forward for the relief of those that <coughs> voted for that part of it, that may not have voted for it because they didn't believe in the wildlife pathway or other things that were going on in other segments of this county. So we have to keep that in light when we're voting on these projects and the purpose of Measure D and how the phones are, uh, funds are being allocated. We obviously have a very transparent process so that the community and all of you that are here with the concerns see how every dollar is spent, how it's stretched, how it's prioritized, and how our different jurisdictions have said what their priorities are so that they can go ahead and have those projects put in alignment um, and prioritize to get, um, get out there and working on them. So, so please believe that you may not like something that's part of that, but we all came together, we all made the compromise, we all agreed at two thirds that the measure D was to be allocated for these resources to happen. So I will, I will support um, these projects. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. I'll just make a couple of comments. Uh, so I have reluctantly supported the Highway 19 project and I, because a couple of people, uh, co commissioners here have uh, gestured to, you know, that, that item and the will of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, the city council has voted to support moving that project forward. I have been reluctant in my support because um, as I've been reluctant in supporting anything related to highway widening, including ox lanes, um, because I, I do believe that they are not going to improve the congestion situation, and I do believe that our EIR um, suggests that the greenhouse gas emission will not be improved and potentially will be, um, uh, we will have increased negative impacts. I, um, I also understand that there are uh, a significant portion of the community um, is interested in um, trying to get some traffic relief. And um, so while I hope that as we move forward, um, we will find alternative um, options, um, I uh, will support the, um, the staff recommendation today and I, I um, w was inclined to include some kind of um, uh, condition or delay in the Highway 19 transfer, the money transfer. Um, I um, will save that for our CIP review in January and um, so I did wanna say that I'm reluctantly supporting these measures that are are just really gonna lead to, you know, through induced demand to more cars and more greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. I also wanna just say a word about Highway 19 because it's probably, for a bicyclist and a pedestrian, it's probably the safest crossing of Highway 1 because there's a, a bike lane along the levee that goes underneath Highway 1 um, and it's a pleasure uh, to be using that bike lane uh, to go over to the other side for various business and not have to try to get across Highway 1 um, at 
at the light, which is always tricky because there are, it's probably the worst or the second worst intersection in the city. So um, while I think there can be disagreements about priorities, um, certainly in terms of safety for bicyclists and pedestrians getting across Highway 1, uh, the Highway 1-9 project is not a problem, would, would, does not create any additional problems. Um, and as uh, Commissioner Brown has indicated, it, it will provide some relief to some people. It's not going to be a cure-all for sure. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we've had enough discussion. I am going to take uh, my liberty as chair to just elaborate a little bit on this topic. Um, I, first of all, foremost, I want to thank Rachel for assembling a great package here. I know there were a lot of work went into this, and obviously by the conversation today, this was a very uh, needed conversation we need to have, and I, I want to commend you on always delivering a professional document for us to evaluate. Um, I, I want to bring up something that's a little off topic, but uh, I went on Thanksgiving to uh, Petaluma and uh, happened to go over the San Rafael Bridge. I don't know if anybody's aware of this. I think this is recent, but they've taken the top portion of the San Rafael Bridge and put a barrier all the way across that bridge, removing the shoulder, it's now a bike lane. And that's a pretty dramatic move, okay, to, uh, because what that does now is if there's any accident on that portion of the freeway, you would be reducing that bridge to a one-lane bridge. But this is a uh, significant uh, improvement for bikes, for bicycles and pedestrians, and I saw bicycles and pedestrians going over that bridge at a calculated risk, but maybe that's the, the, what we need to do to, if we're gonna advance pedestrian and, and bicycle work. So uh, I just wanna commend whatever agency or whatever act of Congress it took to, to remove a, a lane off of a major bridge. Uh, did you wanna weigh in on that? Did you have that? Because I would love to know how it happened. I was just gonna say that that they was Caltrans. <laughs> okay. All right. It's well, yeah, and, and, and you know, whatever it took, it was probably a big <laughs> leap of faith, but it did happen. Um, the other thing I want to comment on is, you know, uh, Commissioner Kaufman Gomez brought this up, and it was, uh, you know, a lot of people take credit for the success of Measure D, and I just want to make it really clear that everybody should take credit for, for Measure D because there was things on there that nobody liked, and there might have just been one thing on there you liked, which gave you enough reason to vote because it did not win by that much but it was because there was something for everyone. And I think what you just saw today up here was as you saw commissioners struggling with working and taking money maybe from their agency to another agency and supporting <laughs> other agencies. And if you think what the mission of the Regional Transportation Commission is, it is to do what's best for the county. So I applaud this commission, which what I think is gonna be this vote. So with that, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries unanimously and thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to item 23, which is my cruise 511. And I'm not sure who's doing this presentation. There you are. I didn't see it back there, okay. <laughs> Welcome, Amy. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Amy Naranjo, RTC staff and program manager for the Cruise 511 program. I'm here today to recommend distributing $100,000 of Measure D Transportation Demand Management, or TDM funds, for countywide employer outreach and marketing contracts for the Cruise 501 program. I'd um, also like to provide an update um, for my colleague uh, Claire Fleisler at the City of Santa Cruz on the, um, the Go Santa Cruz program, which is using the Right Amigos Network. So if you'll recall, in September, the commission directed RTC staff to work with the Cruise 511 Implementation Work Group, which consists of staff from RTC, the City of Santa Cruz, University at Santa Cruz, and Ecology Action, and for the group to um, prepare a recommendation for distributing those funds. Um, so as the, the group has been meeting over the last couple of months, and in this time we have developed a plan uh, where we recommend distributing $70,000 of that to Ecology Action for countywide employer outreach, and then another $30,000 for marketing and branding, um, and using both of those for sole source contracts. The marketing contract would go to a local public relations consultant, Miller Maxfield. Um, the city of Santa Cruz is currently working with both Ecology Action and Miller Maxfield in their Go Santa Cruz campaign, and this feels like a natural leeway to um, use them as well for the countywide launch. 
Um, by using both of these, we'll ensure the, continui the continuity of both the transportation programs with employers uh, countywide, as well as provide some economies of scale with marketing components that are already being developed and have been developed. Um, Miller Maxfield contract with the city was competitive, competitively bid and awarded um, in August 2019, so only a few few months ago. And then Ecology Action um, has a they they have they offer a unique service that um, in that they provide an emergency ride home or are already working with employer, employers countywide doing outreach and training workshops, and they also offer a zero interest bike loan. Um, so Go Santa Cruz is the first public network that's using the My Cruise 511 or Ride Amigos platform. Um, so essentially, when when I came to you in August and I explained what the Ride Amigos system, it's it's an online software. It's a platform. We've titled it My Cruise 511 for our area, and then the City of Santa Cruz has the, their network, which is Go Santa Cruz, and that's directly within our My Cruise 511 platform. So you might hear a couple different names. That's how I'm trying to uh, uh, explain that. Um, so the Go Santa Cruz program launched uh, just recently in October, on October 1st, and their goal is primarily to reduce the drive alone rate in downtown from 69% to under 50%. <coughs> and they are doing that by providing different uh, transportation options for employees. Within their program, um, currently they've been able to reach 125 local downtown businesses 800 downtown employees have already enrolled in the My Cruise 501 Go Santa Cruz network. And out of 800 employees, out of the, a total of approximately 4,000 downtown employees. So that's roughly a 20% participation rate so far in the first couple of months. Within that time, the city has distributed 500 annual transit passes. Those are local transit passes, um, 150 jump discount memberships. <coughs> Um, 100 preloaded bike lockers that are in $20 increments, and then 50, do 50 downtown dollar rewards for logging alternative trips, and each of those are $10, um, $10 values. In addition, uh, the downtown employees have already logged over 17,000 non-SOV miles and in, in 5,000 non-SOV trips. Um, and then in that time, they've also reduced or saved uh, 5.5 tons of CO2 emissions um, by using alternative transportation. Uh, the city has an annual budget of $580,000 for this program, um, for their downtown uh, Santa Cruz program, and of that, $400,000 is exclusively for incentives. Um, so the incentives that I mentioned. Um, in comparison to the Cruise 511 countywide program, we're only looking at having approximately $20,000 in incentives. So there's quite a big a scale um, and the scope that we're doing from the countywide approach to the uh, the downtown approach. Um, let's see, so we expect that while well, working with um, working with Miller Maxfield and Ecology Action to continue moving the program forward using the existing resources that we have, building on them, and then working with uh, targeted employers. So we've essentially, we've outlined approximately 20 em major employers throughout the county, um, um, looking at both working directly with the county, with the local jurisdictions, and then major employers that are equally distributed amongst all the supervo supervisorial districts, just so that we're, we're trying to capture a little bit throughout the entire county, um, while also maintaining our focus in, with limited staff time to really go out and do this work. And we'll be relying on our, our additional partners to help move this program forward. Um, let's see. So with that being said, we recommend uh, distributing the 70,000 to Ecology Action and 30,000 to Miller Maxfield for marketing for our, the Cruise 511 countywide employer outreach and marketing. Um, with that, I end my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Amy. Any questions, Commissioner Ron? Commissioner Leopold. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> and. Uh, I think this is a great idea working with uh, uh, two local organizations who have a great track record and have shown to, to um, be very successful. So I think Ecology Action, Miller Maxfield are good choices. Um, just had a question about Goes uh, Santa Cruz, which I think is, is, is it's a great um, experiment. 
yeah. um, and trying to figure out wh uh, how does uh, what's working in, um, and how to scale that will be very important. The, the question about um, uh, vehicle uh, uh, trips outside a single occupancy vehicle mm -hmm. um, or other modes, do, do we, will, will we have information about whether those are new trips, you know, because if I'm a downtown employee who used to take the bus right. and now I get a free pass, I'm still taking the bus, um, but I, I, I haven't changed that dynamic. Do right. we, will we get a sense about that? I'm, I'm just Yeah, wondering. that's that's something that's in the works right now. Um, so one of the barriers to getting people in our system is an extended registration process. If they're having to spend 10 minutes filling their information out, their commute behavior, their travel behavior, they're more than likely not going to finish the process and get in the system. Right. So our focus primarily right now has been just to get people in any which way, give them some incentives, give them some, um, <coughs> any of the incentives, and then get them in the system. And from there, we can then give a baseline survey. And we're in the process of, de of developing that baseline survey to track that commuter behavior, to, to answer those questions. What are you doing currently? And then based on the incentives that we've distributed, the challenges that we've had, and so forth, how then at the end of the pilot program, we'll do another survey and then measure that participation rate from there. Yeah, well, I just think it would be great to have, uh, to, to be asking some questions about what they did before the program started right. too, because um, if I drove my car before, but now because of the, the bike incentive mm -hmm. or, the, or the bus pass that I'm now not driving my car, right. that's a huge win. Absolutely. Um, and that's one of our goals is to try to, once we get an employer on board or once we get folks on board into the system within 90 days to distribute that baseline survey so that we can find um, some of the before stats. Great, thank you, Amy. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you for your work. Thank you. A couple of questions or a couple of comments. Transportation demand management programs are among the most cost effective for those of you who are not familiar with them of any of the transportation programs this commission funds. They're relatively inexpensive, they're very fluid, they're very, uh, can be often very innovative as you've mentioned in your staff report, Amy. Um, they can be um, changed uh, much easier than trying to change <laughs> a hard um, scape project, which is much more bureaucratic and much more difficult to do. So to get people to change their behavior and how they transport themselves is among the hardest of transportation policy decisions that we make and programmatic uh, decisions or implementation that is done by your staff and your partners, Ecology Action and Miller Maxwell and others. Very, very difficult, um, but it's been around for a long time. Um, and and we've, for many of us who've been in this field for a long time, we've known that it works very well when done well and well funded. So I'm really excited to hear the amount of resources that the city is putting forward. I agree with Commissioner Leopold it's nice to know the net new behaviors that occur, but to get people in the system just to be able to demonstrate the importance of um, these alternative transportation modes and people's willingness to do it is also very, very valuable. So I just hope that other jurisdictions in the county, can, including the county, consider putting some incentives toward this, uh, the 511 system, um, and putting more, because for the, every dollar we spend on this, uh, we're gonna get um, a huge bang for our buck. Um, so thank you. Um, and then I just wanna make one correction on your staff report. Um, as of April 22nd, next year, 2020, Ecology Action would have been around for 50 years. Wow. <laughs> Good to know. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Um, yes, uh, the, the peer review and the um, part of it, I'd like to see, or maybe you already have this in, in place, if, if I'm a candidate and I put my, my paperwork in there and I'm registered in the system and I'm utilizing it, W are you providing them with an incentive for a referral process for somebody that's using the system that may be um, a selling point for it to um, in expand it? Because if you're doing the employer and there's 20 employees, those 20 employees are now disseminating more information out there about the program. And do you or will you look to see about incentivizing them for the referral process to expand um, the bandwidth of the use of the program in those resources? That's something that we actually have not discussed at this point, um, but it is something that is easily set up and available in the Right Amigos platform. Um, and it's a really good option. Thank you for that. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Uh, I, 
I just want to. Oh, thank you. I just want to uh, make a comment and put in a plug for the Go Santa Cruz program. Uh, you know, I think one of the um, kind of one of the issues that we really had a very robust and thorough discussion about was the provision of bus passes to make those available to all downtown employees. And at the time, um, you know, there was some reticence to do that. We were talked about doing it as a pilot, a small, a limited number, and because there was an expectation that people would not take advantage of bus passes, they would not ride the bus. And what we see here is, you know, we at ultimately the council decided that we were going to go for it and see um, what might happen um, and, and increase the budget for our Go Santa Cruz program. And I'm really happy to see that in the first two months, um, you know, 500 bus passes. Um, and so I'm looking forward to hearing more about the increase in ridership and reduction in, in car travel and um, anticipate that the numbers will continue to increase as people learn about the program. So I really think that, you know, just going, I guess my takeaway message here is that, you know, just making that decision to invest and go for it can really, um, you can see some real results pretty quickly. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Looking for a, a motion here. Public? Thank you. We haven't heard from the public, so. That's okay, good. <laughs> There is somebody Thanks for that. <laughs> Mr. Commissioner Schiffman. Uh, we're now up to the public. Thank you. Mr. Peoples. Thank you very much. Brian Peoples, Executive Director of uh, Trail Now. Um, you know, my day job, I'm an engineer. I've been an engineer for 30 years over the, in the high-tech industry. And you, when you, we design a system, to f you're essentially designing a system to fix a problem, right? And you, you identify metrics um, or requirements of, well, how successful are we at fixing that problem? And you, you identify those, those metrics too. And, and um, Mr. Leopold made a good point of, you know, are we regenerating and, and already addressing existing? But when we look at engineering a, a system, I think right now we need to kind of change our, our mode in the transportation world. Um, vehicle miles traveled is really a poor metric. It really is a poor metric with the, the way technology is transforming, right? What we need to look at is people miles moved, transit systems miles moves. How are we moving the public, right? And if we keep going in with this, this mindset that we need to restrict the, this resource, this vehicle resource to enable the public to move, it's deterring from our design of our system. I mean, our public is aging. My mother has, is you know, in a wheelchair. She has to have direct movement from her home to her final destination. And that's the direction we need to get to, is we, our expectation that we can't have a transportation system that the public can't use because they're stuck in their house. So we really need to change our mindset on what metrics are we measuring to our design of our transportation system. And vehicle miles traveled is the wrong metrics. It's people. How are we moving the people? How many people can we get through our transportation system? Um, again, it just comes down to that, y'all. It's, you know, we gotta get away from this idea that um, vehicle miles trans movement is, it, it, it's not the metric that's driving it. We want to look at how do we maximize the current thoroughways that we have, the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail, the highway, Soquel, and the surface streets. How do we maximize them in an efficient way? And vehicle miles travel is not a good metric. And I think we're hearing that from the state as well. They're realizing that that's not the metric that you measure to because with autonomous cars, it's, it's, it's going away. The systems are going to be able to handle the demand of our aging popula population, and we need that. Thank you very much, and I support them. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Piet Kanda from Ecology Action. 
and I also want to commend staff for um, putting together this transportation demand management effort. It's a collaborative effort in terms of working with the city of Santa Cruz, um, large employers like UCSC um, and other jurisdictions. And Ecology Action has been part of this coalition for, for many years. Um, we have a program where we do employer memberships and we have 24 employers locally that are part of that um, fee-based service. Um, such employers as um, the Seaside Company, Looker, and um, other, other private businesses. And then in the public, um, public sector, we have UCSC and the county. Um, Ecology Action provides services like an emergency ride home service um, to guarantee that everybody that uses sustainable transportation, if they have a personal emergency, they can, they can get home and take care of that emergency, um, whether they carpooled, van pulled, or walked quickly. Um, so that's a service that's kind of general for sustainable transportation. And then also, we also provide a zero interest bike loan, so people have economic barriers to buying a bicycle, both um, regular bicycle and electric bike, they, they can do so um, with the financial assistance. And we also do um, customized um, programs for large employers, such as um, bike safety workshop, bike rides, um, bike safety distributions. And so, you know, we're looking forward to continue working with this collaborative effort, um, especially with the Go Santa Cruz program being so successful out of the box. I mean, um, 800 signups, the miles that they've um, already clocked for sustainable transportation is pretty significant. Um, over you know, 125 businesses that have signed up just in the downtown district. So um, we believe that you know, people outside of the downtown district and um, employers are going to want to also be able to sign up and get the benefits of this online platform, the Ride Amigos or My Cruise 511. So we, we would help RTC staff to get recruitment, get people signed up, get them to understand how to use the system, encourage them to do carpooling, um, take the bus, walk, bicycle, other, other forms of transportation as electric bikes become more popular, that kind of makes people go further and faster. So, and then also just to um, reply quickly to some questions, the city of Santa Cruz hasn't done baseline intakes as people sign up, but they have done two transportation studies over the last couple of years of downtown employers. So they have a general um, read on how many people bike in the, in the downtown district, how many take the bus, how many people are driving. So they have th those metrics to go off of as a baseline and then can do follow up on that. So that's one thing that they, they have there to um, quantify the improvements. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners, RTC staff. Uh, my name is Tom Kennedy, and I work with Ecology Action, and uh, I'm a program coordinator with uh, Adult Sustainable Transportation Programs. And I just wanted to report back on, uh, we've done our, now our first two uh, presentations as part of our work with Go Santa Cruz. Our first presentation was with city staff, and we sent out a, uh, Claire sent out an RSVP link and within about an hour we had about 30 RSVPs. Uh, we ended up having about 60 people attend the workshop um, and there's continued excitement from city staff uh, to have access to uh, information and resources regarding uh, both signing up for the Cruise 511 platform as well as the bike safety and uh, commute support that we provide via those workshops. Um, we ended up having to move from the city conference room to the Civic Auditorium uh, main floor, which was, that was my debut presenting at the Civic, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. And then we also just delivered a, our second uh, presentation at Looker on Wednesday to about 34 employees, and again, there's, you know, incredible amount of excitement and interest in shifting um, to more uh, sustainable modes of transportation. And so um, thank you for considering this proposal. Thank you for those comments. Hi, Jessica Evans, City of Santa Cruz. I just wanted to voice my support for this really extraordinarily innovative program, and um, I'm super pleased that you guys have supported it. Kudos to you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. David Date with Silver Beach. Um, we lost our bus service uh, September 2016 before Measure D was passed. Um, it still has not been restored. 
Um, I've informed a few people who have been at the bus stop waiting for a bus that's never coming that the bus isn't coming and I try to offer them rides whenever I can. Um, I saw a gentleman named Tim who sees in, lives in Seascape and he was pacing back and forth at the um, Seascape bus stop that is on San Andreas and I offered him a ride. He wanted to go to downtown Santa Cruz. Uh, he informed me that the bus is always late so he plans on getting to the bus stop late and then he waits and he does, he's not, the uncertainty that he experiences, not knowing if the bus had already come, if the bus is coming at all. Uh, and this is pretty much his entire life, um, having uncertainty and anxiety about moving. Um, so it was, um, it was an interesting perspective. I just wanted to share that. Thank, thank you for that comment. <laughs> Move the staff recommendation. Uh, second. Motion by Schiffer and second by Leopold. Any just, other comments? Well, just quickly uh, to the last speaker, the uh, Metro is actually uh, going to be putting in place a system so you'll be able to track when the buses come, when, when your bus is coming or whether it's already passed. I think it's going to be installed this year. I mean this year. Um, uh, it's a million dollar system to be able to put on all on all buses. Um, also, uh, Amy, if you could provide us with a list of which employers you're working in our jurisdiction, I'd love to have that. Any other comments? That, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Takes us to item 24, so on call capital project management, management services contract award, Sarah Christensen. Still morning, Sarah, welcome. Good morning, thank you, Commissioner. Um, right, uh, here today to um, hopefully uh, get a contract awarded to help us with delivery of capital projects, um, specifically the regional projects that the, R the RTC staff is responsible for delivery. Um, <coughs> so Measure D passed in 2016 and it included a um, expenditure plan of projects and um, at the same time, RTC, given this new obligation of delivering projects, we did not really increase um, our resources internally. And so uh, the purpose of this contract is really to help support staff in getting these capital projects implemented, um, which is uh, a huge priority for this commission. And so um, a little background about the procurement. We released the RFP in, uh, in October, we received three proposals. Uh, the selection committee, um, which was made up of staff, it was uh, Guy Preston, executive director, myself, Ginger Dykar, senior planner, and um, Grace Blakesley, senior planner. We uh, reviewed and ranked the submittals. We interviewed all three firms um, on November 15th, and uh, CSG consultants, they were, um, they scored the highest uh, based on the selection criteria and one of the main reasons why they had such a strong team is because they had a very diverse team of professionals who have experience uh, across all modes um, because we have a really unique program of projects that aren't, they're not just highway projects, they're, you know, we, ha we own a rail corridor, we have active transportation projects, we have trails, we have uh, transit projects. Um, there's just a lot of needs that we have and, and enabling, having consultants um, in our back po pocket to um, support us allows us to leverage their expertise um, instead of having to hire a staff person for each one of those expertise. So um, <clears throat> the scope of work um, is really to help us with three main categories of regional projects, the highway projects, um, the rail infrastructure preservation projects, and the uh, MBSST projects. This, uh, the contract is structured as an on-call contract with task orders being issued as needs arise and our estimated um, need at this point uh, from a fiscal perspective is approximately $400,000 a year. The term is three years, so that puts the total contract value at $1.2 million over three years. There is an option to extend the contract 
an additional two years if needed. Um, but with that, I'd like to uh, recommend that the commission approve the resolution, which is a replacement page, just a note, um, to uh, award the contract to CSG consultants. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions for Ms. Christensen? Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Um, and the funding sources for this, is this from the D or is there from another funding source? Yes, this contract will be funded by um, the various categories of Measure D. Any other questions? Go ahead and open up to the public. Anyone from the public like to comment on this item? This is Brian Peoples, Executive Director of Trail Now. Um, we support this. We think that the RTC staff is moving in the correct direction. In industry, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We go out because we can't afford to have the specialist. We can't afford to own the specialist, so what you need to do is go out and contract out with the specialist. So this is the correct approach. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you can mark this day on your calendar. <laughs> we are in agreement. <laughs> it Hallelujah. sounds like a great move to uh, ca build the capacity of the RTC to move important projects forward, and we hope you vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Engineers bring the world, uh, the, bring the community together. Barry Scott, uh, Aptos. I, I also rise in support of uh, this this uh, contract. And I want to add, just because I've been watching this crazy rain that we're having, and I'm I'm reminded of what happened in to the to to the rail line. Right now, we have well crazy rain, and it's having an impact on some parts of our county and in the rail corridor. And I hope that uh, everybody's uh, vigilant uh, about. And I'm sure Sarah and and Guy and Luis will be looking into some of the some of the problems that m may be imminent uh, so that we can uh, um, uh, avoid uh, damage that that might end up being very very serious thank you thank you any other comments okay I'll bring it back I would move I'll I would move the staff recommendation I'm going to go with a Leopold with a motion a second by Kaufman Gomez okay uh, any other discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, this is uh, item 25, track improvement for rail vehicle demonstration. Mr. Mendez. Yes. Uh, good morning, commissioners. As you know, the uh, Regional Transportation Commission purchased the San Cruz Branch rail line right away in 2012 to preserve existing rail service implement recreational rail service, build a bicycle and pedestrian path, and investigate potential future rail transit service. And the RTC has been working to implement all of those uh, items. Uh, and, and the latest is the alternatives analysis that the RTC is, uh, is undertaking. And at its uh, September meeting, the RTC received a presentation from TIGAM, a company in Southern California that manufactures electric trolleys. Uh, to do a uh, to conduct a, a proposed um, demonstration uh, of their vehicles, and the RTC was was very receptive and and um, asked that we return uh, with uh, further uh, information and, and recommendations. Now, um, TGM has been working with RTC staff with uh, railroad operator uh, St. Paul and Pacific uh, Railroad, the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, and to ensure that everything needed for a passenger rail vehicle demonstration is in place. Per the Federal Railroad Administration requirements, the track um, must be at class one for a passenger rail vehicle to operate on, on the line. Um, there have been inspections between uh, Capitol and Santa Cruz, which revealed that some work uh, is indeed needed to ensure that the track is at class one. And completing the work will allow this demonstration, plus will allow the RTC to, to uh, permit other demonstrations uh, if the RTC would like. Um, also, the RTC has a commitment under the Administration Coordinations and License Agreement uh, that's between the RTC and the rail operator, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, uh, stipulating that the track uh, must meet FRA Class 1 standards before the RTC can hand the track over to uh, St. Paul and Pacific uh, Railroad. And then at that time, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad will, will uh, 
uh, take responsibility for uh, maintaining uh, and, uh, and using the track. Uh, so that because of the work uh, identified will, uh, in the inspections will allow uh, for the demonstrations and will help uh, to meet the RTC's responsibilities under the agreement with St. Paul Pacific Railroad. Uh, staff solicited quotes from contractors for the work that, that's needed and the contractors uh, submitting quote industrial railways uh, company submitted the lower quote. Um, there was a slight difference uh, in their quotes in that industrial uh, railways did not include uh, disposal of the ties uh, after they got removed. So in uh, working with industrial railways, we asked where that could be in included. Uh, and they said that indeed it could be included and they would be you know, uh, a total contract cost of $60,000. Uh, now, the art, which is still lower than the um, other uh, quote that was submitted. And under the RTC's uh, you know, recent inclusion uh, under the California Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act, which allows negotiated contracts up to $60,000, this will, will just barely uh, you know, uh, meets that. Uh, therefore, the RTC can enter into the negotiated contract uh, with industrial railways without having to do a, a bidding process uh, for that. So staff does recommend that the RTC approve the attached resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into a prevailing wage no-bid contract with industrial railways company to upgrade the Santa Cruz branch rail line track between Capitola and Santa Cruz for FRA class one standards uh, for a contract value uh, not to exceed $60,000 in a term uh, ending December 31st, 2020. Uh, we expect the work will be done much sooner than December 31st, 2020, because uh, TGM intends to have a demonstration in February of 2020. Uh, uh, and they have been working towards uh, making sure that, uh, as I said before, they meet all the requirements to, to do that. Uh, and TGM uh, would like to run uh, between Capitola and Santa Cruz, and then also plans to take the rail vehicle down to Watsonville to showcase it uh, for a couple of days. Uh, and the administration coordination lines agreement that the RTC has with um, uh, the railroad operator does allow for the RTC to provide licenses to third parties for uh, demonstrations or, or other uh, events. Uh, uh, TGM will bear all the costs associated with the demonstration, except for the improvements to the track, which as I mentioned is part of responsibility of the RTC uh, uh, under the agreement with the railroad operator. So staff does recommend that the RTC authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute a temporary license agreement with TIGM for demonstration of the uh, passenger rail trolley vehicle between Capitol and Santa Cruz and, and in Watsonville. Um, the agreements that would be entered into would be substantially in the form that's attached to your staff report, but they will still need to go through you know, review by legal counsel and, and so on. Um, so with that, you know, staff has the recommendations in front of you, and uh, uh, there are funds for um, the work being recommended and the actual demonstration uh, or providing the license for demonstration does not uh, incur a fiscal impact to the RTC. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Mendez? Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to make sure that when we do have, because we're talking about the demonstration as well as the repair, that we invite Monterey Bay Community Power so that we have somebody from that agency here. We know that over 60% GHG is in transportation and they are obviously our electric generator um, a procurer and I think that we may be able to show them some of the type of electric transportation projects that are within their jurisdiction and uh, that way, when it comes to future projects and funding and potential of some things, uh, I think it would be very beneficial for them to be included, uh, as well as um, Tansy, uh, if we get a hold of Debbie Hale. Um, they had somebody that came in to say that they would like to do a demonstration, and Tansy um, board declined to go ahead and process a request of that nature that was unsolicited. So there may be something there with um, other kinds of interests of things on that. And um, the the cost, are we charging them a fee for the permit to use this to show or in the future any other vendor that has an interest in showing a demonstration or part of the application process so we're covering the administrative expense in doing so? Uh, in this case, uh, there has not been a, um, uh, a fee 
that's been proposed to charge uh, again for the operation. As I mentioned, they, they are covering uh, the full cost of bringing the, the, the um, uh, vehicle here to demonstrate. A lot of times uh, these demonstrations do have a, a shared cost between the, the uh, company doing the operation and then the, uh, the agency that's providing the uh, uh, service here in this case that is not, that is not being shared. Uh, it will also provide some benefit uh, to the RTC's efforts under the um, alternatives analysis uh, because you know, then the community will be able to see uh, something that uh, could potentially be on the straight line or, or, and it could be one of uh, several demonstrations the RTC could have so the community can see uh, um, the types of vehicles that uh, could potentially be used. Uh, as the RTC is moving forward with, with this alternatives analysis. And then the last part of it is just the, the media capacity so that we can actually promote that this is occurring for those that have an interest in seeing what this is about. So making sure that we have a media component when this project comes forward for the community to be aware of it. Commissioner, and, uh, C C Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to follow up, um, for this demonstration in the city of Watsonville, it, w is it possible to have it first prior to them going to the service section of the capital of Santa Cruz to start the promotion off in Santa Cruz, in Watsonville? You know, I, I don't, I wouldn't know about that, but Mark Johansson is here from uh, representing TDM, so he can probably it, respond to that. And, and then one more item. And since, since we're going in this route, um, <coughs> would it be a cost to uh, work with Metro to try to get a shuttle to go from Watsonville to Capitola to service the, the, this demonstration train, uh, so we can try to s see what, what utilization we can have with Metro and, and, a, and a train service. Uh, we can ask Santa Cruz Metro what the cost might be for a shuttle. Thank you. Commissioner Mulhern. Uh, thank you very much. Um, how, how did we uh, select this segment of the rail line to repair? It is the segment that, um, well, there are several parts of the line that actually aren't available because there's still storm damage repair that needs to be done. Uh, and in this segment, there isn't uh, a storm damage repair that needs to be done. It also is a segment that, that saw work most recently uh, on the track uh, because in 2016, uh, IO Pacific, who was the previous operator, um, did quite a bit of work on that section of the track to run their Polar Express train that they ran from Santa Cruz down to just past Capitola. And so the thought was that most likely this segment would be in the best shape and would need the, would need the least amount of work so that it would be available for this. And, and it also seemed desirable uh, to have the demonstration be uh, uh, within the more populated area of, of Santa Cruz County so more, more of the residents of, the Santa, Cruz, of Santa Cruz County would get a chance to see it and experiences that they would like. That they would like. And um, the, the alternatives analysis will be exploring um, high capacity public transit. <clears throat> Just to, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the full array of, of TIGIM's products or technologies, um, but based on what I've seen on their website and on the, in their previous presentation, it looks like they move more to do streetcars for tourist destinations. I do see that, that one of their technologies looks like it could be scalable, but how is this, how does this meet the definition of high capacity public transit, this particular technology that they're gonna be using? Uh, maybe Mark can um, talk a little bit more about what their technology can do. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Mark Johannesson. Um, I have a law practice here in Santa Cruz City and live in Aptos and I'm helping TIGAM on this project. So a couple of questions. Um, first of all, thank you for the staff, Elise and, and um, Guy on helping uh, move this project through. As you know, we're on a fairly tight schedule. We started looking at this back in September, even before that preparing, but it does take time and we've got the demonstration coming at the end of February. So some of the um, issues I think that have been brought up, first of all, we are going to be engaging Bill Maxfield in the uh, pu public outreach campaign, and we expect to be able to work with the um, RTC on that public outreach as well. Um, I've already made contact with the CEC, California Energy Commission. They have a hydrogen unit. As you know, this particular vehicle is a is a transportation vehicle. It's not a um, it's not a tourist vehicle. It's an enclosed uh, trolley for humans, uh, for for actual um, uh, commuting. 
This particular vehicle holds 100 people. Uh, they also have a model that holds 200. And these can be um, tagged together through a variety of means to scale up as, as need arises. So they are commuter vehicles. And um, the, um, we've also, I think the um, comment to reach out to Monterey Community Power, I think that's a, um, it's, it's on um, our list of things to do because um, even though this is a battery electric vehicle, it has a hydrogen fuel cell top off generator. And to the extent you can use green power going into the generation of hydrogen, you have a totally green system um, from end to end. Uh, and the only emission is going to be water. Um, we'd, we would also, um, reach out to the um, Bay Area uh, Resources, uh, Resources District um, uh, because as you know, uh, those of you who sit on that board, 90% um, or 80% of the particulates in the air are from mobile sources and so this type of system would actually fold into reducing uh, those types of emissions. And TAMSI as well, um, I reached out to them and the expectation is once the demonstration is in place, we will have um, like a groundbreaking day or something like that and the idea would be to invite uh, California Energy Commission representatives, TAMSI representatives, folks from the uh, Monterey Bay Power um, as well as local representatives and the California Fuel Cell Partnership as well to help push this out. So we'll have the facility, uh, part of the local fundraising we're going to be doing to actually be able to push this out to as many people as possible, but we'll be looking for um, assistance in that on other, other channels. In terms of Watsonville, the plan was to um, um, have that demonstration first. Um, I think the suggestion has been Watsonville Depot in that area where there's parking. There's a spur, I think, that, that could be used for that. Um, uh, and um, in terms of the, uh, let's see what else, the, um, oh, um, so uh, that's it. I, we'd like to actually park it in, in Aptos Village, but I understand the, there's going to be an issue with the bridge there. So um, I, I know the staff is looking at an engineering report and that may or may not happen. Uh, if it doesn't, it's, I think the, the trajectory would be to go to Watsonville stationary exhibit there, have an event around there, a look and see. Uh, we can't really move it uh, because right now all that track is considered to be accepted track, which means you can't run passenger service on. So we're working with Progressive Rail on getting the approvals to do that. Um, then in terms of coming back to Santa Cruz, we'll have the, the, the FRA approval now that we've got, um, we'll have the class one repairs made at that point. Um, we will have to have, uh, according to Progressive, probably some type of consent form that may go along with this. So we'll work out the mechanics for that on how to easily do that. So um, as, as these uh, smaller issues arise, um, we're going to be addressing those as those come up. And just for folks that um, want to get a hold of uh, at least the TIGM side of this, uh, my email is mfjlaw at gmail.com. It's markfrankjekyll at gmail.com. And I'm certainly willing to talk to anybody who would like to discuss this and I'm going to be available for further questions and comments. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand, then Schifrin. Okay. Uh, just a question. Oh, oh excuse me, hold on a second. Excuse me, I got a follow-up there. That's okay. Oh, I'm no, sorry. I, I'm just curious if this is going to implicate the, the alternative analysis. What, what sort of data are we collecting on this who, and who's collecting the data? So, um, yeah, this is a demonstration project and, and we totally understand that uh, there's going to be an alternative analysis and there could be other, other options. So um, our thought was to, um, if there are data requirements to work with the folks that are doing the alternative analysis to see what they would want to get out of this. Um, obviously there's, a, a, you know, rider satisfix questionnaires, number of riders, but it is going to be, um, you know, it's going to be an unusual demonstration because it's, you know, people aren't going to rely on it to go to work. But I think the plan would be to have uh, an infographic of something of that nature that has a schedule on it for the period of demonstration. So you know at this time it's going to go at this location and, and look at the stops where uh, throughout the, the route, um, or it'll come every so many minutes, that type of thing. So there, there is uh, data I think that can be thrown off by a project like this, but it's really working with the um, stakeholders on what they would want and how we can accommodate that. But, um, uh, but because it is a demonstration project for a number of uh, factors, uh, yeah, we, if we knew what uh, data requirements there are, then we can work that into the project as well. So we'll ask our consultants then to devise some kind of metrics that we can use? We'll work with the, with the consultants, yeah. Okay, and, and what is the maximum speed allowed in a class one rail? I think it's 25. Actually, no, class one rail for passenger, it's 15 miles per oh, hour. 15, I, okay. Think, I think so, okay, so it's not really a, a, a public mm -hmm. transit. 
project we're looking at. Um, and how are the at grade crossings gonna be handled? I realize that we currently have people flagging at right. those sorts of intersections. Is that gonna be? Be flagging. Okay, thank you very much. And in terms of uh, rolling this into a more per, uh, faster streetcar, obviously there's different improvements that would have to be made to make the ride smoother uh, to get it up. This, this particular section is 3.9 miles, which at 25 miles an hour is about six minutes uh, to, to do with one, one trip, so. Commissioner yeah. Bertrand. Yeah, Glenn here, you're gonna get some uh, customer feedback, I guess. So that was one of my questions. The other question is actually for Luis. Um, where's the uh, rock going to be put? The Capitola is the curve that was mentioned in the report. Uh, it's um, as you leave Capitola and go towards um, uh, Brighton. That towards, no, towards uh, Santa Cruz. Oh, the, it's, it's, it's the first curve that that you uh, that you get to. Okay. Uh, there's some track needed on the. I mean, some rock needed on the outside shoulder of the curve. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Mr. Schiffer. <laughs> As I understand it, the the uh, demonstration rides are going to be free. Correct. For everyone, is there is the commission going to receive a more detailed report on the specifics of how many trips a day, where the stops are going to be, um, things like that, or do is that known now? Um, what, how's that, uh, I'm not sure, maybe that's a question for you, Luis. I mean, is, it, is this gonna come back? I'm, I'm very supportive of doing this. I think it's a really good idea, uh, mm -hmm. but there's no information on the specifics of it that is, front, uh, is in front of us. Uh, I, let me just also say that um, I was a little concerned about the commission spending money on this at this time when there's so much uncertainty. I think the fact that the service is being offered free is really a good justification for uh, spending some money to really get that kind of a demonstration. But there is, I know when I mentioned it to a couple of people, they said, well, where is it gonna stop? Where are people gonna park? What, mm -hmm. How many trips a day? Uh, what times is it gonna happen? I just wonder, will the commission have mm -hmm get that information or do you, is that commission, is that information available now? Uh, well, so far we have not uh, received all, all of those details from um, TGM. I think they're still wor working on, on that. Uh, and uh, based on our conversations, uh, it seems that there would not be any stops in between uh, Santa Cruz and Capitola, but I don't know if that's something that, that you know, TGM could work, work into that, and we can come back with you know more detailed information if you like as we get closer to the demonstration. I, well, the de if the demonstration is going to start in February, then I think it's something that should be on the January commission yeah. agenda to sort of get those details. And yeah. uh, and again, this is coming from. I don't have a uh, a set of priorities. I just think it would be useful for us and the public to know uh, before it starts just what's going to what's gonna be involved. I know one of the other issues that I think we should get a report on is kind of the noise impacts. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's an electronic vehicle is great and that really is a, will cut down on the vehicle noise. But as some of us remember, it's the whistle, whistle blowing at the intersections that drives some people crazy. So um, we should get a report on what that you know, how that's gonna work because somehow it's not a problem with big trees, but it was a problem with the, uh, you know, the Christmas Express or whatever it was called. Yeah, well, and I will also remind that when we, the last Polar Express that went from Santa Cruz to someplace, I don't know, uh, New Brighton, right, yes. um, that we got, we, we got uh, the, the noise complaints were, were pretty minimal. Um, in terms of the blowing of the horn, and that was using uh, a more traditional uh, uh, diesel uh, train. And I, I, I will just add that uh, I'd love to talk with you about having us stop or doing something for Live Oak. So. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the discussion was that um, in the rail city in the past, you had identified five or stop, five or six stops. The idea would be to mimic those in this demonstration because I think the idea is to say, to show that this is a, um, a valid way to commute. For example, if you have weekend and we have a stop close to 41st Street, you can walk them all, get on there, go to, sit, go to the, the boardwalk. Um, and if you have a set schedule, then people could actually, for the period of demonstration, use it to do ordinarily, ordinary daily 
type things. Um, so and that, that would be one purpose of the demonstration. In, in terms of the noise, obviously it's a, an electric vehicle, there's no noise, there's no ever overhead wires, the only noise would be the, the noise whatever it makes on rolling down the track. And in terms of the stop, uh, the uh, whistle, it's an electronic device, it's just a, it, it's ding, 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 you know, like a, a streetcar. It's not a horn like a, a train has. And that the decibel level of that horn can be adjusted to whatever the community wants. Beautiful. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I'm gonna open it up to the public for some comments. Uh, Brian Peoples Trail now. Back to the metrics. It's very important that you outline what are my criteria that I'm gonna measure to. Um, no, you're not going to adjust the decimal. You have to meet the federal requirements for the decimal, for the noise. Um, what's going to happen to the traffic when the train stops next to 41st, when 41st is shut down while the tra train's sitting there? So those are metrics that staff needs to go off and define first. Um, honestly, this demonstration, if you're going to make it a demonstration on evaluating a system design, you have to define your criteria that you're gonna design to and look at those and how they perform to it. This feels more like a propaganda promotional thing. And that's really not good when you're spending a million dollars you're spending a, another million dollars to see how best to use that corridor, whether it's rubber wheels on asphalt or fixed rails. So you're really, that's poisoning, and this is the, what the public gets frustrated with. It gets frustrated that you're, 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 you say one thing and then you go and you do another. So going and doing a, uh, a, you know, a party and promoting this while you're doing a independent study is really um, not upfront. It's it's not being honest, honestly. Um, and then finally, you know, we're talking to Progressive Rail. I'm actively talking to them, and and they're not. Uh, the the trolley company has called them multiple times and what Progressive Rail has said is they feel like they're trying to sell them a trolley. And that's what they're trying to do here, is they're trying to sell you a transit vehicle. And for you to believe that you're not paying anything, that the $60,000 is going to be Progressive investing in your tracks, well, what happens if the the, tra the study comes back and shows that a train won't work. Well, you've lost that 60,000. In addition to that is the tracks, in order for Progressive Rail to take over the tracks, you have to upgrade it all the way to Davenport. So that's millions. So this 60,000, we think that it might move you in the direction of making Progressive Rail responsible for it, that's not true. Progressive Rail has publicly said, has informed them that they're not taking over the responsibility until you upgrade the tracks all the way to Davenport. So don't think that you're upgrading this and that's a, a value added investment, that it won't uh, cause, that it will incrementally move you in that direction because it's not. So we don't recommend that you invest in it today, maybe down the line, but you're contaminating and poisoning the studies. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. Hello, uh, Keith Otto. A um, couple questions that the commission might want to consider on this item. Um, you know, how does the demo train get to Santa Cruz and Capitola? I'm not clear on that. Um, second, what's the northernmost portion of the rail that will be used? I think there was reference to mile post 19. Um, it's unclear if that includes <coughs> the bridge over the harbor, um, perhaps not, but if it does, what's the condition of that bridge for use for this demo? Um, also, where is it that passengers would be loaded and unloaded from uh, this uh, demo uh, train? And the question there is around um, safety. And then lastly, um, is the investment that would be made in these, uh, this section of the rail corridor, um, since we haven't yet seen the results of the alternatives analysis, is it possible that we're investing in something that is not going to be ultimately used in in the future. So those are my uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, my name is Tina, I live in Aptos. Uh, please accept the staff recommendations in item 25. I voted for Measure D, which includes money to maintain the rail line while studying transit on the corridor, and I know that the rail contract with Progressive requires upgrading the entire line. Item 25 is to upgrade four miles of track and to provide a license for the battery-operated electric streetcar that can carry 100 passengers, the same as two metro buses, and is 100% in line with Measure D. I'm a little nervous. Um, let's see here. Let's see, the tracks, let's see, I recommend the approval of this. The tracks will be ready to bring other types of zero carbon demonstration services here. So let's stick to our Measure D promises and commitment to transit and the environment and approve this package. I live in Aptos and the rail is behind my backyard. And uh, I'm looking forward to the demonstration services going from Ca all the way to Capitola. I really hope that it could run down to Aptos too. I think it would be great for the two week demonstration. Lastly, I think it's, let's look at maximum options, benefit benefiting maximum amount of people. It's safety first for children, grandkids, disabled, seniors. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Jessica Evans, the City of Santa Cruz. Um, I just wanted to ask you to please move forward with this project. Um, obviously, there are funds set aside in Measure D to do exactly this work. Um, this was approved, it's, it's sitting there. Um, there's no reason not to do it. And um, I also think it's really important that the community start to see the possibilities that are available in terms of the various different kinds of transit vehicles. And sure, uh, you know, these guys are trying to sell us a trolley and, you know, they sell trolleys, so, you know, that's fine. But I'm sure there will be other vehicles available um, to come and do demonstrations and, and you guys may want to ask for some kind of super fancy BRT vehicle to come and demonstrate to the community as well. I mean, I, I just don't think that um, turning our backs on the possibilities would be a good way to go. So I encourage you to move forward with this proposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Sally Arnold, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Uh, of course, we're so excited to see the plan for these track improvements. Um, I know you've already got the money allocated in your budget and the track maintenance is part of your obligations. So in a lot of ways, this doesn't seem like it should be a surprising or controversial measure. It's just, you know, kind of what you plan to do and you need to do. But it is so exciting anyway, because once those tracks are repaired, the, the demonstrations are possible. And, um, you know, somebody complained about, you know, maybe TGAM wants to sell, sell you a vehicle. Well, you're shopping for vehicles. That's what the, a, the alternatives analysis is all about, right? This vehicle, that vehicle, what might be the best choice? And so it seems entirely appropriate to bring as many po possibilities to town as you can. And the, I feel like also, I mean, obviously this is not the same as running, you know, a permanent service the length of the corridor, but it's a chance for people to see different vehicles and what they might mean. I know that, um, you know, I have some friends who live near the tracks and I think they're permanently scarred by that train to Christmastown. It's like they just can't get over it. And um, I actually live pretty near to the tracks. I didn't think it was that big a deal, but all I can tell you is some people, it's like they will never forget it. And it seems like a chance for them to have a different experience with a rail vehicle is really important. I mean, I hear people tell me, I don't want to see a 19th century coal locomotive on those tracks. It's like, yeah, I don't think anybody does, but they just can't get over a big loud train. And so it's really important for us to see some modern vehicles out there so people ha have an idea of what we're really talking about here. And um, I think that this just has a wonderful opportunity for you to do some shopping and for the community to also do some shopping and see what the options are. Um, so I just, we just enthusiastically uh, urge you to approve this item. I think it's gonna just be great for the community. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is Johanna Lighthill and I live in Aptos. The reference to shopping reminded me of the 
time when my, <clears throat> excuse me, my daughter was shopping for a car when she became of age and she wanted to go test drive a Tesla. So I had to tell her, sorry, we have to investigate our price point before we go uh, test driving anything. So I hope that you guys will consider that when we're looking at options for rail or the possibility on the corridor. Um, more down to the bare bones is that I also, like Mr. Otto, wonder how the, the train will get to um, Santa Cruz. Uh, currently, there are some vertical restrictions on Highway 1, and most motor homes or mobile homes or whatever are, are diverted off of Highway 1 into Rio Del Mar, into Seascape, and up they take out, excuse me, they take out curbs and they take out power lines as they go. And our, um, I'm happy to say Measure D funds recently repaved a lot of our streets in Rio Del Mar and Seacliff. Sea and I hope that, that um, this transportation is considered in saving our streets as well. I, I don't know what the effects are, but I hope you'll consider. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again, Gina Cole with Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, I would encourage you to accept the, the, the report as is. Um, I really thank you, Aurelio, for mentioning Watsonville and having working on having some way to move folks from Watsonville to, to utilize this. I'm a firm believer in experiential education. Um, we don't know what we don't know until we try it. And I would encourage all of you to play hooky and take a ride. Uh, when it's offered. Thank you. Sounds like Thanks, Gina. Good afternoon now. Uh, my name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm here just to uh, offer a few comments on the proposal before you. Uh, number one, I would encourage you to accept it um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, sooner or later, you need to maintain the rail line. The voters voted money to do that. You ought to do it make the voters happy. Um, demo trains are really a great idea. They will inform our community, many of whom have yet to actually see a passenger train. I have talked with many people whose total life experience was taking BART to a, a Raiders game one time. And uh, you know, it would be great to expose them to what is available in the marketplace today. And uh, as uh, Gina said before me, there's nothing like touching and seeing and hearing or maybe not hearing a train that would be really uh, in informational and educational for our community. Um, with regards to the question about charging uh, for the demo, um, I was around when the demo trains were brought here back in whenever a very long time ago. I'm not very good with dates, but it was a long time ago. 90s. And as I recall, the, the uh, RTC spent money. They, they paid to have a train brought here. In fact, I think there were three of them or something like that. I, I don't remember the details anymore. Um, and here you have an opportunity to get a train here for us to look at, for our community to learn something from for free. So uh, please, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get this done. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Barry Scott, Aptos, uh, yeah, it was 1996. I have a couple of buttons. It's a flex liner from uh, that year. There's a, the, uh, there's a return of the, return of the Suntan Special and the Coastal Cruiser, three, three one-day services. <laughs> so one-day services are great. This is expected to be, what, f uh, a couple of weeks or several days. How fantastic is that? Um, with regards to uh, the uh, $60,000 expenditure, that's part of the commitment for the entire line. It's not new money that, that needs to be found. Um, I think we are uh, blessed with this opportunity for people to see uh, what, what modern, modern Tesla-like technologies uh, can do. The, the cost of batteries for vehicles for transportation continues to fall. Their power content continues to grow. This is such a no-brainer. Um, I think a, a, th this single vehicle is 100, 100 passengers, and I think when you do the larger vehicles and the fact that they can be ganged together, you start getting into 200 and 300 passengers. I am delighted that this is going to Watsonville. 
um, even if it's not able to carry a passengers, that Watsonville should be possibly even be first to see this, this uh, vehicle is significant. Um, I, I don't know about the bridges, but if it's possible to bring it for a day over the Capitola crossings to sit in Aptos, I think that would be terrific. I mean, while we have it here, let's, let's do as much as we can with it. And uh, I just, I, I encourage the commission to, to approve everything in, in this uh, item 25 and uh, I can't wait to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael St. Aptos, um, totally support this uh, rail demonstration. I think it's a wonderful thing for our community. Uh, also it came up with just uh, two ideas uh, specifically for safety and liability exposure. Have we considered any, or are there any encampments or people living along those tracks? And that prior to doing this demonstration, will that issue be taken care of? And then also, remember these tracks have not been used for years, and the local people along residential and business are not expecting maybe a demonstration like this. Is there gonna be specific notices per property saying here are the dates, there's gonna be train running along here at that time. Just beware, because I think they go out there and use it for recreational purposes, so they need to be warned, and that's just my suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. I can handle some of those questions. Uh, there are encampments all over the corridor. Um, hundreds of people utilize the corridor every day for transportation and leisure. Um, I am in the works of making a time-lapse video so we can document this and actually realize how much use the corridor is with no accommodation whatsoever. Um, will this displace that use? Um, yes, obviously. And another thing I've been working on, I've been uh, organizing community group uh, efforts to uh, remove vegetation from the corridor. We've done this once. We got a bunch of invasive species, a scotch broom, uh, cleared out along New Brighton, which was encroaching on the rail corridor. You cannot meet uh, federal safety or FRA one designation with vegetation that encroaches on the tracks. There's $60,000 worth of vegetation removal that needs to happen before this makes class one. So this, this, this idea that it's all gonna get done for $60,000, I don't know if the contractor has actually walked the tracks and checked it out. Um, odds are they're, they're gonna fall flat on their face and, and pr probably ask for more money, but we'll see. Um, Another project we did, there was a, a on the Aptos crossing right by uh, Aptos Barbecue, there were two two by 12 planks removed from the pedestrian path. I spoke with the local sheriff, Jordan. He told me that he had notified the RTC that this was an, an incredible hazard because they dropped right onto Soquel Avenue. Someone could fall through here and get ran over by a bus. And um, we went out last week and we patched that up, put two planks down. I think it's important to preserve access for the corridor. This, the trail is already happening. A train, um, lack of maintenance, all of these things come at the expense of the, the access that people already enjoy in the corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Come on up. Unbelievable. I just would like, to, uh, Robert from uh, Aptos, I'd just like to second uh, the feelings of that engineer fella. He seems the most uh, lucid of all the opinions and uh, um, <clears throat> um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, f I forgot what I was gonna say. I'm, uh, yeah, anyhow. Uh, um, Thanks for coming up. Yeah, yeah. Sure Thank appreciate you. it. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. David Van Brink, City of Santa Cruz. Uh, this is a very modest expense with high value. I encourage you to approve this. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a quick question for, I don't know if it's for staff or for our attorney, but I, is there a position of the RTC of anybody doing work on the rail? Is that? Uh... 
somebody we can kind of address that just for general? Uh, We've uh, become aware um, today and pre prior to today of trespassing on the rail line. We have contacted law enforcement. The rail line is not open um, for people to walk on and to um, physically alter our structures. Um, it's dangerous and um, it's not legal. Um, this is a law enforcement issue and we will be addressing it in such a manner. I appreciate that clarification, thank you. And uh, Mr. Schiffer, you had a question? I was just gonna make uh, the staff recommendation, uh, to move the staff recommendation with a additional direction that we get a report at our January meeting on uh, response to some of the questions that have been raised today about the details of how the demonstration is going to work. I'll second that. Motion by Schiffer and second by Bertrand. Any other comments? Sorry. Um, yes, just for clarity purpose, um, the transport of, the, of this unit to the tracks, could you just clarify that now? Because that doesn't have any logistics about the timing of when it gets here and all of the other displays. There are uh, multiple times um, the community have asked for that to be addressed. So yes, thanks for the question. The, um, under the license, the, um, the demonstration is uh, from February 20th to March 5th. It comes in on a low boy with rails. So basically it's just uh, trucks trucked in, loaded, uh, lowered down, loaded on the tracks. So um, there's um, uh, a number of places that this can be done on both the, the Watsonville side and the Santa Cruz side. And in terms of the timing, it's really just, uh, I'm looking at the weekends we're gonna be doing this. I think it's- Why don't we wait on that until we get our report yep. next week? Yep. Uh, next okay. month, thank you. Thank you, I'm sure we'll have all the details. We expect all that at the report. And Commissioner Bertrand, um, briefly, it was great to see so many people supportive of this particular option to demonstrate a different mode of transportation on the rail corridor. And um, I think it indicates that people are looking forward to different solutions than have been proposed in the past. And the alternatives analysis, I think, is gonna take advantage of this to broaden our perspective on how to use the rail corridor, which I'm very happy to see. Um, the other comment is um, some of the uh, people have talked about um, the people along the corridor, not the homeless, but the residents. And I think in terms of the analysis uh, metrics that we should consider is what the people along the corridor think, you know, when a vehicle's passing their, um, their property, uh, what do they experience, uh, what do they think about it, noise, et cetera, and stuff like that, vibration. I've heard some people come here and talk about the vibration. I know this vehicle is lighter, but still, these are issues that might be important in trying to understand what the experience is. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimously. So this is gonna take us uh, to item 25A, which is actually consent item 12. And uh, Luis, are you gonna do Sure, I can. Okay, thank you. I can say something uh, briefly. Um, as uh, stated in the staff report, there are a variety of, uh, of agreements uh, as part of uh, owning the, the rail line, uh, which are operating agreements that were uh, assigned to the, to the operator. Those include agreements that are for crossings. So in this case, there is an, it's a, a crossing at Aptos Creek Road that has, has been there, but it's been a, a private crossing. It's being turned over to a, to a uh, public crossing. And the, and the County of Santa Cruz is, is working on that as part of the Aptos Village uh, plan and so they have already worked out an agreement for that crossing with um, the railroad, op railroad operator and under the agreement that the RTC has with the railroad operator it states that even though those operating agreements are not are not agreements that the RTC is party to that the RTC uh, would uh, that the agreements would come to the RTC to write consent uh, to those agreements and the question was about um, whether the RTC might be under responsibility for costs associated with that, um, the improvements. There is uh, section four uh, of the agreement that states that, um, uh, that the entire cost and expense incurred in connection with, with uh, the design and construction, maintenance, repair, et cetera, would be borne by the licensee. In this case, the licensee is the county. Uh, but again, this agreement is between the operator and the county, not the RTC and the county. So if it, so that does leave a bit of vagueness potentially as uh, uh, your executive director mentioned with respect to hazardous 
uh, materials that, that may be found, because a lot of times the owner of a property is deemed to be responsible for that. Uh, so the RTC can add a condition to, the, to its consent to say that the RTC will not be responsible for any costs, including any hazard materials costs that might be associated with the work, and, and uh, we can communicate that to the county. Well, I hear, as you say, um, the, this is not an agreement between the county, uh, between the RTC and either the ra rail or the county, but we, we are giving consent to it. And so I just am concerned that at some point the county will come back and say, well, uh, we have to pay these costs, but really you should pay them because you're the owner. So I, I would, uh, as you kind of didn't quite recommend, but suggested that we approve this agreement, but with the condition that um, the, the, it, the, that it be conditioned on the fact that the county, that the commission not be held responsible for any of the costs of the project. And I'd make that as a motion. And just uh, just to uh, clarify, the, the motion of the commission would be not to approve the agreement, but the consent yes. to the agreement. Yes, I would be to move the staff recommendation with the added uh, direction that a condition be added to our consent that the commission not be held responsible for any of the costs of the project. Second. Okay, motion by Schiff and second, and this is to uh, ex accept the uh, yeah. staff recommendation with taking away no additional liability for any reason. Commissioner Mulhern, you have a comment? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, a couple of years ago, the county embarked on uh, an intersection similar to this at Trout Gulch um, as part of the Aptos Village Phase 1. Um, in that project, we discovered a great deal of contamination in the rail bed and incurred um, a great deal of costs associated with remediation at that site. Um, at the time, there was um, an agreement made between the county and the commission to share the costs of that project with the understanding that any other at-grade crossing project, the cost for remediation would be borne by the applicant. Um, that agreement it stands. Um, our, our team has been out to the site, has investigated the current site, um, has determined the extent of the contamination at the site, and has then budgeted for full remediation uh, to be borne, the cost to be borne by the county. Um, it, this, this is alre already conceived. We've already designed the project. We're ready to go out to bid. Uh, this, is, this is the last phase of, of our project, um, and we are expect to go to construction sometime in the spring. Um, if we're going to have a policy discussion about how we handle at-grade crossings, I believe we should have a policy discussion about how the RTC is going to handle environmental remediation at grade crossings, rather than doing it in an ad, ad hoc manner such as this. Um, this project is designed and ready to go, as I said. Um, any further delays is going to d delay our construction horizon. And uh, f furthermore, the construction of this project is, is a, a condition of approval for Aptos Village Phase 2. So any delays from this project will then implicate that project. So I will be voting against the motion for all of these reasons. Could I respond because there's no intention in the motion to delay the project. Um, and if I understood what uh, Commis Commissioner Mulhern was just saying, there's already an agreement that the county's gonna pay the full cost. So That's we don't have that agreement in front of us, so I don't think it's inappropriate to just add a condition that, or add a direction that that condition, which seems to reflect what has already been approved, be part of our uh, approval. So I, I don't see why this would either delay the project or is inconsistent with previous decisions that were made. Um, I just think with the information before us, it's prudent to add that added direction. I'm going to speak out here. I'm going to bring in our, our, our attorney and also maybe our executive director. I want a little direction here because I'm at concern. I, we've done projects in Capitola, built a skate park and found contamination underneath it. And I think we've all done projects with the contamination. And I don't know that we're reinventing the wheel here by saying that the owner of the property cleans up contamination. So now I'm more concerned with M Mr. Mulhern's point about this being you know, if we're gonna make a policy decision, if, if, if we own the rail and there's contamination there, are we able to skirt our responsibility? This is a question to you, Mr. Mash. Are we able to skirt our responsibility here or shift it somehow? Um, you, the responsibility can be shifted. Okay. Um, the, um, 
if the contamination exists on the property right now, but it's not being disturbed, there may not be an obligation to remediate. The, the reason that there would be an obligation now is because the, because the at grade crossing is being installed. And so, so that's what's necessitating it. Parties can shift the financial responsibility for it. The legal liability does generally reside with the owner of the property um, in terms of the way that a state regulatory agency would look at it. Um, in this instance, um, the commission may want to consider uh, that the consent that was part of the motion, I've asked Mr. Schifrin if he would agree with this approach. If there is an agreement already in place that does actually accomplish that contractually in terms of shifting that responsibility to the county, then you wouldn't need to, you wouldn't need to implement the, con the condition, if you will, because that is already satisfied by virtue of the agreement. And so, if the if the commission would feel um, uh, would feel that it would be uh, more appropriate to acknowledge that agreement uh, on the assumption that it exists, um, you could just reflect that into the motion. That if to the extent that there is an agreement that already shifts the responsibility, that satisfies the condition that you're asking for. Hang on, well, well, I still have it here because I, I'd like to. I, I think the board's a little anxious right now, and I'd like to put us at ease. And I would like to use that friendly amendment to your motion that uh, in the absence of any language or contract that exists, the RTC will bear no additional expense. Not in the absence, but in the existence of In the of, existence of, a, of, 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 of an agreement, sure I, right. I'm I, thinking we're trying to agree here, Andy, which is rare, but I mean, I'm, I'm going for it here. Well, I don't, so. think, it's, I don't think it's rare at all. I okay. think it's normal. Okay. Um, but I'm happy to have the, uh, uh, my, my only concern is that this is not the commission's project. The commission shouldn't have to pay for remediation. When the commission does the project that requires remediation, we're responsible for paying. That seems reasonable. If there is an existing agreement that says that the commission will not have the liability or the cost of any remediation, then I'm happy to, that, to have that be reflected in the motion. Um, the uh, attorney came up with language that's I've forgotten, but it's acceptable to me. Sure. So I'm willing to have that be a friendly amendment to approve the staff recommendation with the additional language as suggested by our attorney. I think this supports uh, Commissioner Mulhern's position also. I'm going to ask him, but because but I, I don't want to be here setting a precedent for any other crossing and or disturbing thing, but we could deal with this one case with this existing contract. Does that satisfy? I, my only concern is delaying this project. That's it. Well, and we, no we have, we have if, if this has to go back to the county for agreement, no, do we need no, to consent well to the, it? This is not an agreement between the county and, uh, and the commission. This is an agreement between. If the county has to agree to the consent, then that, we're, that the conditions that we're placing on the consent, which would require some kind of vote of the body, can someone clarify that for me? I think or all can this we pass requires this here is and then move forward with the project. I believe this all this requires is for our attorney to look into the fact that there is already a contract that exists. Right. We would simply be confirming that, and to the extent that we can confirm that that agreement does exist, then there would be no operable condition at all. And so no they, further the consent would the consent would simply stand alone with no delay. But in the meantime, we wait until that is determined. And then if it's found that there isn't a written agreement in place, I mean, Mr. Mendez, you were part of these conversations when we had this had this deal back with Trout Gulch. Can you perhaps enlighten us as to whether there's a written agreement? Uh, there was a, a written agreement to pay, to share the cost for that, um, um, uh, the remediation at the uh, Trout Gulch road crossing. I do not recall whether the agreement actually includes language stating that you know for future crossings the RTC will not be responsible i do remember that there was conversations about that that for future crossings that the that the cost would be um worked into the project is um, um, uh, you have mentioned uh, commissioner Mulhern, that uh, that's already been done for this project um, so that would be in line with those conversations but uh, but i do not remember whether it, that was actually put in writing, so. So the, the, count, the county is prepared to bear the costs. We have budgeted for this particular project, 
if we're gonna make a policy decision going forward, it's my firm opinion that we need to make a policy decision at the body and not do it in an ad hoc basis, and certainly not to implicate this project, which is central to a development that we're trying to complete. So thank you, Mr. Fisher. Well, I would say that the commission has a policy that it doesn't pay for projects that it doesn't have any benefit from. Well, then I mean, why do we need to, to add a extent, consent to this? If I, if I could finish, to Please. the extent that this is uh, imposing a condition on our uh, cost on the commission for a project that the commission has not initiated and has no, had no particular interest in doing, that seems inappropriate. It was done once, um, and I don't think, and I, and I thought as a result of it there was I was hoping some clear understanding that it would not be done again. And if that exists, then I think that's fine. But I don't, I think it's important that we not consent to an agreement that then's going to allow the county to come back and say, give us $200,000 to remediate the, the hazardous material. If that is clear that that's not going to happen, then I'm fine, and I think that's what the, uh, the motion would do. Well, the, the language of the agreement says that the county will bear the full expense, so I, I'm not sure where, where the county would. Yes, but that is not an agreement with the commission. I understand that's that. A, that's and an agreement with and, the. And I also reassert that the county has, has planned for and budgeted for all the re environmental remediation on this specific project. And furthermore, that if we're going to make a policy decision, it should be a policy discussion and not in an ad hoc basis. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mendez, was uh, Mr. Machado in these conversations you had? No. I think this predated Mr. Machado, um, but I, I, I. It was John Presley. Uh, yeah, I think it was when yeah the previous director was here. So and and most of the negotiations were also with our previous executive director as well. And also previous council. And, and previous yes. Sir, were you in these meetings? So I haven't been. <laughs> And obviously this predated me, but I've been involved in the current project. Um, every milestone of design, I have reviewed the plans, and I understand the Trout Gulch um, project. The reason there was so much remediation required for that project is because there were so many deep excavations to install a closed drainage system. They did trenching, they installed inlets. Um, I saw the plans for this segment, and I, I asked the designer to redesign it and um, eliminate all of the closed drainage features, which would result in an extensive contamination cost. It doesn't really matter which entity um, is responsible for paying for it. If we can reduce that cost, whether it's the county or any other entity, we want to do that. That's our job as engineers is to reduce that obligation. And so hopefully that puts a lot of you at ease, is that we learned a lot of lessons from the Trout Gulch project, this project, it's completely different. We, um, there's design implications that we have uh, have in place now. They've also done a, a environmental site assessment as part of this project, which was not done for Trout Gulch. Um, they have a site uh, soil management plan that they prepared for this project that was also not done for Trout Gulch. So we learned a lot of lessons from the Trout Gulch project. We're ahead of it. The county has budgeted funds um, as Mr. Mulhern um, explained, that will help remediate. So we don't anticipate having a surprise bill like we did on Trout Gulch. Just to so put you at ease. I'm gonna let someone else weigh in first and back to you, Ms. Schiffrin. Commissioner Kaufman, go ahead. Um, for starters, one, I don't want to delay a project that's fully funded, ready to go, shovels ready to go. Um, two, uh, we, we have the language in item four. And the item four indicates that the licensees are fiscally responsible for the project. Three, in the event that there is a discovery, which uh, you've learned your lessons, and had there been something else that was found that wasn't part of you know learning the lesson from the Trout Gulch, if the county says, okay, well, we did find this, they know at this point this body is going to say, you know that you've said that you've taken this on and you'll be responsible to do so, so don't come back and request it from the RTC for anything more. I, I think that that's been pretty well cleared, flushed, let's get this project going, um, and that I and when it comes to a policy part of things instead of an ad hoc, I, I think that that is something that we can um, have have the RTC look at and see if there's other concerns that we have to make it a policy of some sort or change, modification, or review. Well, uh, based on that, I, let me just say there is no desire here to hold up this project. Okay. Um, maybe the word that's problematic is condition. So um, based on the last conversation, I'd sort of amend the motion to say 
that to approve the staff recommendation with the understanding that there will be no cost to the commission as a result of this project. So that if in fact that all of our good expectations mm -hmm. turn out to be wrong and the county comes back and says, oh wait, we found things that we didn't expect uh, and therefore we're asking you to help pay, where we think you should have to pay for them, the commission will, based on this conversation and this understanding, say no. So if that's um, acceptable to the, ex to the second, I would uh, make that as the uh, revised motion to just have an understanding that there'll be no cost to the commission as a result of this project. Were you the I second? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, that, that's acceptable to me. I would, I would just say that um, I don't see anything in this uh, causing a delay in the project and in my role as a city council member, I, you know, we deal with this all the time and um, the, uh, the party that stands to gain from the improvement or you know, whatever the, um, the project is, is responsible and that's made clear. And so I, I think that making that clear is not necessarily gonna do it, make anything happen differently than is already anticipated. Um, this is just a, an effort to um, say that and state that up front that this is the, our, the commission's position. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about it unraveling because uh, there was obviously this conversation that took place and there's no other players in the room and Luis doesn't have a vivid recollection of what happened here. And I think that it could potentially delay it and I, and I go along with Commissioner Kaufman Gomez, I don't want to delay a project that's 90% done. Uh, we just got done in the item before this approving things where we shifted money from one city to a county. We were back, we were all harmonious and now I'm like, well, okay, we've got this project here, 90% done why are we putting up this radar? So I'm, I'm concerned about approving the motion to say not any other expense when I know in my heart for the city of Capitola, we paid expenses for contamination and we all know that that's the jurisdiction's responsibility. And apparently this Trout Gulch went bad or, or went deeper than they thought. They've made modifications. They made an agreement that whatever expenses there are, I know this is all hearsay at this point because nobody's here to verify that, but I'm inclined to believe the conversations that took place so I'm, uh, I'm very confused. I don't know how I'm gonna, whether I'm gonna support this because I, I don't wanna get in the way of this project. And Sarah, you stood up, so okay. I'm gonna let you say something. So just another point to consider is that the county will need a right to enter and construct this project. So we will be entering into another agreement. So we're gonna have another bite at the apple if that's how we wanna address this issue and just make it a clean approval of the staff recommendation. So without delaying this project any, w w the action today may not delay that because we're gonna have to come back and get this agreement to, to start the project. Would that, that's right. accurate. So we could, uh, is there a way to postpone this decision until that meeting when more information can be brought back to us? Well, I would doubt that the county would want us to postpone it. They want to have the consent of the commission and you know, for the commission to give its consent with a particular understanding, that helps give direction to the staff in their negotiation with the county on the right of entry agreement of where the commission's coming from. Right. I don't disagree that the commission should take responsibility for cleanup <coughs> when the commission is doing a project. Or as the city of Santa Cruz has found out when they were doing, when they're doing segment seven, sure. they had lots of cleanup responsibilities. But it just seems th this is not a project that this is a this is a private developer, a private development in Aptos, which is between the county and that private developer. That's fine. I don't think there's any. I don't have any objection to that. I just don't think it's not a project that the commission has an interest in, and therefore shouldn't have to pay. So th it looks like that's not the intention, um, and that's great. And I think having an understanding, having that reflected in the right of entry ag uh, agreement when it comes forward. So I don't think any, th I don't think the motion that I'm suggesting will hold up this project. And I think it does reflect a, a, a responsible perspective from the commission to not have to pay for, um, for projects that, it, it's, that are not its projects. I think I'm agreeing with you and I think what's gonna happen is there will be another bite at the apple. Yes. If we wanna reverse our decision, we can. Yes. Okay, so I think we could, uh, we could vote on the motion today and if it turns out that there is a cost or there's something else, we could reverse it at that access here, access next hearing. 
So with that, if there, unless there's any other questions, I'm gonna call, so we're just going back to the original motion was proof staff recommendation with no additional cost to the RTC. With the understanding that there would be no additional cost to the RTC. Is everybody clear on the motion? Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimous. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so with that, uh, yeah, with that, we're gonna have a review of closed session. Mr. Mattis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have three items on the closed session and we will have one uh, open session item at the end of the closed session. So. Okay. Okay, uh, so for this, uh, we're gonna report out at the end of this, so we're gonna uh, adjourn to closed session, but unfortunately that our private room's been taken, so we're gonna ask you all to clear this room and closed session will be held here. When do you expect to resume? Uh, 30 minutes? Hopefully soon. <laughs> Uh, no more than 30 minutes. Sooner than later, <laughs> You believe right? that, you believe anything. <laughs> I don't know, the way it's been going today. With, with 30 minutes, Mr. Matt. Okay, we're gonna uh, resume this session. Um, uh, I'm gonna report on closed session. What I'd like to announce is that the commission got together in closed session and we did, evaluated the uh, executive director. Uh, the, uh, the contents of that evaluation brought us to a consensus that this body uh, unanimously supports the uh, executive director in the direction he's leading the Regional Transportation Commission. We're satisfied with his performance, the way he's conducting business, the reputation he's setting in the community, and how he's interacting with other officials that he has had to deal with. And uh, with that, I believe- uh, I would make a motion oh, that- hang, hang on a Mr. City Attorney, do we have an action that we need to yeah, take? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Chairman, what I would note is that uh, item 31 on your agenda is the consideration of an approval of a step increase in compensation. Mr. Preston's contract provides that at the conclusion of a satisfactory evaluation that uh, the authority can approve a step increase in his compensation. Under California law for executive management positions, we have to state in public session what the increases would be. Mr. Preston's contract provides for a 2.5% increase. That would take his compensation from what it currently is to an annualized amount of 221 70750 if the board were to authorize that and so a I would move that we approve the step increase to uh, the executive director as provided and as uh, enumerated by the attorney. Motion by Schiffer and second by Gonzalez. Uh, any other discussion on that? Any other comments? Uh, with that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. And with that, we are adjourned for the year 2019 to the next meeting.